Sir. Welcome to the 54th Annual Metropolitan Educational Forum. And by looking around the room here, there's very few empty seats for good reason. Uh, welcoming Mr. Butch Harmon today. Uh, I want to commend the Education Committee and Mr. Michael Breed for his assistance. But um, we've had just three back-to-back -back incredible presenters between last year's Spring Forum, Chuck Cook, the fall Cameron McCormick, and then this year, uh, Butch, who we're very happy to have and welcome here to the New York area. At this time, I'd like to start off the program with the invocation by Mr. Peter Prokops. Let us pray. Lord, we come before you today to give you honor and praise. You are the source of all that is good. Thank you for every gift we have been given. We thank you for the opportunity of being in a profession we love. We ask for your hand of blessing for this upcoming season, for good health, patience, humility, kindness, and selflessness. We pray for our troops and our great country. May you keep us safe. Help us to be ambassadors for the game, but more importantly, to reach out and lend a helping hand to the less fortunate. Lord, fill us with compassion and love that comes from above, that we may shine your light on others each and every day. Amen. Thank you, Peter. I uh, just want to make sure we have Butch here before we get started. Beautiful. All right. Uh, on behalf of the entire Education Committee, I would like to welcome everyone to the 54th Annual Metropolitan PGA Educational Forum. Uh, I'm going to be very brief. Certainly, uh, we've got a great program for you today. Our guest needs no introduction at all. He grew up right here in Westchester, where his father was the professional at Wingfoot. He's a winner uh, on the PGA Tour in 1971. But of course, we have him here because he's a great teacher and coach. Uh, we couldn't be more excited to have him. He's been the number one teacher on the Golf Digest list for the last 15 years. And his truly impressive list of students have amassed over 140 uh, wins on tour worldwide. Please welcome to the stage, Mr. Butch Harmon. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, uh, I have this club not to swing, but my back went out on me Sunday at Augusta, so I'm a little tender at times. So if you see me leaning on this club, I hope I don't slip because it's not a wind grip, so I don't know what the hell's going to happen. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> I do things a little differently than uh, a lot of the guys do. I don't bring any presentation. I don't bring any film because I just want to talk to you. I just want to share information. I'm going to talk about a lot of subjects today in teaching, what has helped me through my career, things I have learned from all the other great teachers, from great players. I'll also ask you a lot of questions today while I do this, when I bring up a to topic, because I, for me, I believe in a situation like this that's sharing information. I'm going to try and explain to you the way I've done things how I've learned, who I've learned from, and I want to learn from you. So I want to hear your, your guys' ideas about various things. The first thing I will tell you is I've invented nothing. Everything I'm going to talk to you today, I've learned through trial and error, through listening and talking to other great teachers, and watching players, good swings, bad swings, and making my own decisions on what I think works and what, what I think doesn't work. I'm not a person that believes in a system because I don't believe any two players are the same. What I would tell one person might be the complete opposite of what I would tell someone else, but it's because they have a different problem. And I want to share with you today the stuff that I've learned from the two greatest teachers that I've known in my life. Number one, my father. Number two, John Jacobs from England. I have learned more from those two people than a whole combination of anyone else in my life. And I think the reason being is because they believed to make teaching simple. It was about path, club face angle, and impact, which are probably the most important things in golf, is impact. My dad had a great line. He would tell us when we were younger, 
When you teach, you need to teach at a second grade level, meaning a second grader can understand what you're talking about. With the advent of so much technology these days, with trackmans and flight scopes and the various stuff you guys use that I use, video and everything, I think the art of communication is lost and the art of watching the ball is lost. As a young professional growing up, and even before that, when I was a young junior golfer and watching my dad teach the best players in the world, I started to understand that he got everything he needed off the golf ball. The direction the golf ball started, the spin on the golf ball, whether it went up, down, trajectory of it, gave him an instant awareness of the path of the swing and the club face angle at impact. I think today that's been lost. I watch so many young teaching professionals that are enamored with TrackMan. I'm not an anti-TrackMan person. We use stuff at our schools all over the world like that. I think it has its place, but it's not the end all. I watch even some of the young professionals on the tour. Well, the guy will hit a ball. They never once looked at his swing. They never once looked at the ball. They go over there, the numbers give them this. You're three degrees from the inside, so on and so forth. This is information that helps you and your student learn what's going on, but it's not the end all. So don't put all of your eggs into that one basket. Because if you do it that way, you're really not giving your student the best knowledge you can give them. I've used the, the flight scopes and track mans and, and radar monitors more for club testing, more for, uh, with good players, especially when they change equipment. I don't use it when I teach because I have my own track man right here in my eyes. I look at that ball and it pretty much tells me everything I need to know. So let, let's talk about teaching. First of all, this, I've been a golf pro 51 years. I'm 72 years old. 51 years I've, I've, I've been a golf pro. I might as well have been one for my whole life because I've been around it my whole life. I love what I do. It's something that I've done for so long. I, I tell people all the time if they ever made golf illegal, I'd be robbing a 7-Eleven to make a living because I wouldn't know what the hell else to do. This is all I know how to do. It's what I love to do. People always think that I've made my career because I've only taught tour players. I spend the majority of my time at my various golf schools around the world and at my headquarters in Las Vegas teaching the same kind of people you teach. Bad swings are golf security and job security for us. Boy, and there's millions of them. So we're not going to run out of students. A couple of things I will tell you. As a professional, especially this is for you young assistant pros and stuff, you have to understand that giving a golf lesson is a privilege. The guy that has come to you or the lady has come to you has taken her time out of her day and is paying you good money to learn from you. They have sought you out because they believe in you. You need to treat it that way. I teach all day long, and the hardest thing in the world, especially up here where we're dry in, in Las Vegas, so it's not as difficult for my 16 years when I was in Houston, which the humidity is so bad, I think the, the hardest lesson you give is maybe your last lesson of the day. Because say you've given six, seven, eight hours of, of lessons, man, you're worn out by the end of the day, and here comes the worst player you've had all day. I mean, you'd give the guy 100 not to take the lesson. <laughs> but you have to be just as excited and just as anxious to teach this person as you were for the first lesson of the day. And that's why I say giving a lesson is a privilege. No matter what dollar amount you charge, it's a privilege because they're paying you. They have come and sought you out. So always treat it that way. The other thing I will tell you when you teach is less is more. The less you can say, the more the student's going to get out of it. I'm of the belief when I teach the average player that I figure out what I call the cancer in their swing. The one thing in their swing that causes things to go wrong. And if it's an hour lesson and it takes me an hour to fix that one thing, I'm going to do it. Because when I fix that one thing, three or four other things fall into place. And it's important for you to understand that. You don't want to fix five things to correct one fault. Look at it as, it's like you go to the doctor. You've got a sprained ankle, you've got a cut on your arm and you and you've got a tumor. Well, they're not going to mess with the sprained ankle on the cut. They're going to get that tumor fixed. That's what we have to do when we teach. The more you teach, the better you're going to get at it. What I teach today is not the same way I taught 10 years ago 
or 20 years ago. Now, I'm not giving any of the money back. It's just that we learn as we go on. You should learn from every lesson you give. You'll see a guy, for an example, get in the worst position you've ever seen at the top of his swing, and he'll get the club squared impact. And you're like, holy cow, how the hell did that guy do that? And if you're filming it, you look at it, and you go back when he leaves, you're looking at it some more. And it may be two years later, and you'll get a guy who will get in that same position, and a light will go off in your head. Hey, I saw this guy a couple years ago, and he made this same swing, and this is how he did it. And that's knowledge. That's how we gain more and how we get to get knowledge. Most important thing you have, I don't care how much knowledge you have in your head, how good a player you are, it's your communication skills. If you can't communicate to your student in the proper way where they understand what you're talking about, you're not helping them. You may have all this knowledge in the world. I listened to, I'll, I'll give you, get off the track a little here and tell you a little story about Tuesday at Augusta. Phil Mickelson and Bryson DeChambeau were playing a match against Dustin Johnson and Keegan, Keegan Bradley. Now, you know Phil Mickelson's nickname on the tour is the genius because he thinks he is one. Bryson DeChambeau, I can't understand what the hell that guy's saying when he says hello. I mean, this guy is out there, but he's smart. He's a wonderful kid. And to Dustin Johnson's walking down the fairway, and he said, after two holes, I told these two guys, if I listen to you guys anymore, I'm not going to be able to break 100, so I'm not talking to you the rest of the day. Because they were out there talking about this far out stuff. Bryson puts his, his golf balls in water and Epsom salt and spins them because he says half, three or four balls in, the, in his dozen aren't even round. I'm like, yeah, really? Okay. So these guys are shooting all these scores with balls that aren't round. That's amazing. <laughs> but when you listen to, the, to him talk about what he does, because it's out there. But here's the interesting thing. If one of us had got a hold of him when he was a youngster, and we tried to change his golf swing, we probably would have never heard of the kid. But he has his way of doing it. That's why I say there is no one swing. And if you're teaching everybody to do the same thing, you're not doing a good job. Because everybody's different. It doesn't matter who they are. You know, the stack and tell, still people like to see everybody over here. Well, that's great for short iron play. And if you've got a guy who's fallen back, you're going to have him hang on his left side. It doesn't give you a lot of speed when you hit a driver. But you'll use stuff like that. One and two plane swings, you'll do that. You'll use both for different people. But everyone that comes along is going to be different. So you can't get locked into doing it that way. Excuse me, I've got to stretch this back a little. The other thing that I've always tried to do, you have to make a decision. Are you going to teach golf to people, or are you going to teach people to play golf? I prefer to think that I teach people to play golf. Now, those are two different ways of looking at it. Golf to people is teaching everybody a swing. I prefer to teach people how to play golf. As an instructor, you have to know your student. First thing I do when I get someone I don't know about, I need, to, I need to get a little information from him. I need to find out if he's got any problems. Does he have a bad back? Does he have hips problems? One of the great things with the TPI testing that we use at all of our facilities is we finally figured out when we get people that are locked up in their hips and we can't get them to make a motion through the ball and we're working our tail off to get them to rotate, they can't because they're locked up. And because of all this new science and everything, it's been great because it allows us to get an understanding of what they have to do and it also allows us with the ability of giving them flexibility tests that will help. So that's just another aid that we can use. All right, let's talk about what makes a good teacher. I mean, obviously knowledge. It's pretty simple. If you don't have any knowledge, you're not going to be a very good teacher. And there's so many different ways to get knowledge. This is one. This is one way. I, I've always told younger instructors that I think the thing that will help you the most, if you go listen to a seminar to a guy you disagree with the most on his theories, go to his seminar. And they say, well, why would I do that? I think that guy doesn't know a damn thing about golf swing. I said, because you're going to learn something. You're going to leave there learning a different way to say something, learning something you didn't know. So that's very important. Never, ever stop learning. At 72 years old, I still learn. I still hear guys talk, I'll read an article, I'll read something, I'll watch Michael Breed's show, that's if I've taken a Valium that night and I can get through it. 
But I learn from this stuff, and I, I text Mike all the time, and I'll, I'll, he'll, I'll see one of his shows, and I'll say, you know, I really like the way you said this or that. And that's, that's how we learn. That's the way you gain knowledge. So you never want to stop gaining knowledge. Read as much as you can. Watch as many videos as you can. Listen to as many good instructors as you can listen to. Motivation is huge. We have to be a motivator. I mean, you get a person for one hour, you're giving them a lesson to, and they've shanked the ball for 20 minutes, you literally will give them 200 to quit taking a lesson. But you've got to motivate. You've got to be positive. Okay, we'll get this. Well, let me explain it again to you. Let me show it to you on the film. Let me tell you why you're doing it. You have to be able to say the same thing six or seven different ways. But you've got to be a motivator. I would say a lot of times we become cheerleaders and coaches more than we do instructors because that helps the person understand. It's funny, a lot of young, young instructors have always said, we don't understand why Butch Harmon gets so much success. I've watched him at the Masters and the PGA, and he's just telling jokes out there to his players. Well, hell, if we haven't done our work before we get to the Masters, that's my fault. These guys are uptight. I'm trying to get them relaxed. Unless you're dealing with Fred Couples, and he just wants to have a conversation. I'll tell you a funny story about Freddie. About five years ago, Freddie was hitting balls here, and Phil was hitting balls there, and I'm working with both of them, and I'm standing over here with my back to the, the, the crowd, and Fred comes up, he goes, hey, Phil, come here. Look at the girl in the red sweater right over Butch's shoulder. Wow. And I go to turn around, and he goes, you can't turn around, we're pretending we're talking to you. <laughs> so they're not always talking about golf swings out there, Okay. But at major championships, we've already done our work before we get there. If we're having to do an emergency session, then we're having some trouble. As I told you, communication skills, man, you can't learn that better than anything. As I started the day, energy and enthusiasm, important. You have to have all that energy and be just as enthusiastic at that last lesson of the day as you had the first one. When I was a younger professional, I can remember looking at my lesson book, and I'll just invent a game, a name, Mr. Haverkamp or something. Oh, man, is this guy coming again? Hey, why don't one of you guys take this guy? So we tried, boss. We know you don't want to teach him. He says, but he wants to come to you. I'm like, God damn, is it going to rain today? Could I get lucky? So now I've got to motivate myself, because this could be a guy that's a tough guy. He wants to dispute everything you say. He doesn't feel like he's getting better. So you've got to get motivated yourself to give this guy a lesson. This is, this is the time when you've got to learn something. If you get a guy that's a bad guy, that's always in a bad mood, you've got to learn something about him. Learn about his kids. Learn about what his business is so you can talk to him about different things and get their mind off of the golf swing. And a lot of times this helps because if you just stand there and you're talking X's and O's, this, this guy's going to get so bored because he's already irritated with you because he doesn't think you're helping you. But he keeps coming back because he knows you're good. So you've got to get really motivated to work with students like this. You've got to ad adjust with the times. If you think about the last, oh, I'm going to say about the last 10 or 12 years with the advent of new balls and different drivers, the ball comes off the club face so much faster that we have to change our feeling on how we feel impact should be where we used to like to see guys. I can't make this move too good because it will hurt, but you, you don't want to see Staying behind it too much, you want people more on top of it so they can launch the ball at the best angle they can launch it out with as little spin as they can launch it with. Well, that's equipment's done that. We haven't done that, but we have to adjust to the equipment. When new stuff comes out, you have to try it. You've got to understand what the people are going through, so it's good for you to try the new equipment. So don't be afraid to change. The other thing you have to understand, there is a difference between teaching and coaching. A big difference. To teach is we're actually teaching a student to do something. To coach is you're trying to motivate them, you're trying to coach them to get better through different tactics. So there's two different ways of doing things. There's a time when you teach and there's a time when you coach. For those of you who have had the opportunity to teach some of the better players here in your section or even some of the better pros, a lot of times it's more coaching than it is teaching. It's trying to motivate that person. I'll tell you an interesting story about motivation. You remember when Tiger Woods won his third amateur championship. He played a young kid from Florida, Steve Scott. 
and he was five down at the end of uh, 18 holes. And Steve Scott had his girlfriend caddying for him, who's now his wife, and they're both lovely young people. And Tiger's posture was so bad, we'd never, he didn't even go to lunch. We went right to the range, I fixed his posture, inst instantly everything fell back in place. And, you know, he's going to have a chance to do something no one's ever done, win three amateurs in a row. So I was trying to think of my Bob Rotella speech, what I could tell him to get him motivated to go out and come back from five down. I said, now, Teague, did, I've got to tell you something. We're walking to the first tee, I had my arm around him. I said, did you notice that every time Steve Scott made a putt, his girlfriend was giving him a kiss and she was smiling and laughing at you? I said, that really irritated me. He goes, yeah, it pissed me off too, Butch. I said, well, you kick this guy's ass and wipe that smile off her face. That was my speech. <laughs> Great, huh? Well, if you remember, he birdies the 16th hole to get to one down, which was, now they go to the 35th hole, and he holds a 40-footer across the green with that big fist pump, and he runs. Now the match is even going to the 36th hole, and unbeknownst to me, I'm walking down the hill from the 17th green at Pumpkin Ridge down to the 18th tee, and Tiger walks behind me going 100 miles an hour, and he slaps me on my butt, and he goes, she ain't smiling now, is she? And I said, well, God, that was a pretty good choice. Yeah, I better write that one down. <laughs> I don't know if I can use that again. So motivation is a huge part of teaching. I mean, it's, it's a gigantic part of teaching. The other thing, you've got to think outside the box. I get so frustrated with young instructors that teach the same thing over and over and over again. Basic fundamentals never change. Grip, posture, ball position, alignment. There's no excuse in the world, I don't care what your handicap is, for having poor fundamentals. And if you're teaching the same person over and over again and they have poor fundamentals, that's your fault. Because it takes no athletic ability at all to set up to a golf ball. Set up in a good spine angle, good athletic position, good ball position, good alignment. From there, all kinds of stuff can go wrong. But that's, that's up to us to make sure that that always stays the same. And it's the last thing that players think of. In this day and age, one of the problems you of instructors have is that because manufacturers have made these drivers and they all guarantee they can go a yard and a half further, everybody you teach wants a new driver. And they forget that each individual can only hit the ball so far. The best you can get out of your game is to get the club on the right path, hit in the middle of the club every time, and you're going to get the best out of what you can get. Each and every one of us, when we talk about distance, can only hit the ball so far. I can't tell you in my 10 years of teaching Tiger Woods and then my other eight or nine years with Greg Norman, how many people came to me and they said, you have the secret of distance. All your guys hit it further. Every one of them's long. Give, give me a secret of distance. I said, there is no secret of distance. Oh, you've got it. You know it. All your guys hit it far. I said, let me explain to you. Don't you think if I knew that, I'd be hitting it like Tiger Woods? It's not possible. You can only do what you can do. I had this one guy on an airplane a few years ago, wore me out on distance. To the point now where I just put my headset on and pretend I'm not looking at anybody. My son came, got on the plane going to Augusta out of Atlanta last week, and I had my headset on, and I, I was pretending I was reading something. I didn't even have any music on. I wasn't reading anything. I just didn't want to make any eye contact with someone and answer another, answer another question about somebody's golf swing. And my son, Claude, hit me on the arm, and he, he must have said, hey, Dad, but I didn't hear him. I said, hey, how you doing? Didn't, didn't even pay attention. So we get there. And I'm talking to Nota Begay, and the bags come off, and I pull this bag off, looks like mine. I said, no, that's not mine. And Claude's standing right there. He goes, yeah, Dad, it's mine. I said, hey, what are you doing here? He said, Dad, I said hi to you on the plane. You blanked me. And he says, I went to get my rental car and they said they had two cars for Claude Harmon, and you said you only needed one, and you canceled my rental car I said, I'm sorry. I didn't even, didn't even see you were there. He goes, man, were you in your own world. So I go back to this story. This guy goes to me, and he says, you have the secret to distance. I said, no, sir, there is no secret to this. He said, no, you have it. You've got to give me something. Well, this guy was wearing me out for about 30 minutes. So finally I said, all right, here's the deal. I'm going to give you a secret. I'm going to tell you how to gain 15 to 20 yards every drive you hit. But you've got to promise me you're not going to tell anybody. And he kind of gets in a little closer. He goes, what's that? I said, just move up the next set of tees, pal. It's already 15 <laughs> yards closer to the hole. That's your secret, but don't tell your buddies, okay? That's, that's, I'm not charging you for that either, so you got that for free. But everybody's enamored with distance. If you think about it, 65% of the shots we play during a course of a round come from under 100 yards. Wedge shots, bunker shots, chips, putts, pitches. And nobody wants to practice that. In a lot of the, the clubs today, they've built good short game areas, so we've got to 
really push our students to get in the short game area. All the, and, but yet, all you're hearing is how far they want to hit it. It's, it's pretty interesting when you think about everybody, even when you get the women come out, and they, they want to hit it 300 yards. How about 150 in the air would be nice. But they don't get that because everybody wants to hit it farther. The other thing I will tell you about is a club pro. I've been, I've been doing golf schools now for 20 years all over, the, all over the world. I have academies in Dubai, I have an academy in Macau, a headquarters in Las Vegas, another one, great one in Florida. And people say to me, why did you get out of the club business and get into the golf school? I said, well, it's pretty simple. In my golf schools, I have 10 members for three days and then I get rid of them. And I get 10, 10 new members. I said, it got to the point to me with 300 guys, every one of them complaining about everything every day, that I got to where I didn't care that the window on the cart really wasn't clean good enough for Mr. So-and-so, so it was better for me to move on. But the one thing I learned, and I learned this from my dad, for those of you who are at country clubs, if you take care of the Ladies Golf Association, if you take care of all the women in the Ladies Golf Association, it's going to do you wonders. Do free stuff for them. Do a clinic every ladies' day. When you get extra golf balls from manufacturers from buying so many, give them away to the ladies for their events. You say, well, why would I do that? Because that lady goes to bed with her husband at night. And if her husband starts bitching about the pro at the club and you've really taken care of that woman, she says, you better leave my pro alone. Don't you mess with my pro. He's doing a great job for us. And my father taught me that at a very young age. And I'll tell you what, it's a, it's a great thing. It's not always easy, but I'll tell you, if you will do that and you will adapt that in the way you run your stuff, it's going to do wonders for you. We talked about watching and learning from others. Like I told you, I haven't invented anything. Everything I'm talking to you about today, everything I've ever learned came from other people or just trial and error by myself. The other thing you'll, you'll learn that the, some of the drills we used for all our career, don't work anymore because equipment has changed. Some of the terminology we use doesn't work anymore. So we have to change for the times. I was given, this is pretty funny, I was giving a lesson to a friend of mine the other day and I said, now dude, that's really good. And he looked at me and went, dude? I said, I'm sorry, I spent last week with Ricky, I'm talking like he is now, I gotta get back in my own box. <laughs> and I, I remember going back in my office, I said to the guys that work for me, have I ever called you guys dude? They go, oh, yeah, you do it all the time, boss. Man, I gotta change that. That doesn't sound right. The next thing you know, I'll be wearing a dumbass flat bill hat or something. <laughs> That's not gonna happen. All right, let's talk about giving a lesson. First thing, don't confuse your student with too much information. I said this to you before, I'll say it a lot today. Less is more. The less you can say, the more they're gonna get out of it. Don't stereotype your teaching, I mean don't teach everybody the same way. If a guy's hitting a slice, there's various ways to hit a slice. If a guy's hitting a hook, there's various ways to hit a hook. I'm of the belief, if I get someone who's a big slicer, who comes over the top, maybe has the club wide open at the top of his swing, comes over, you can see how open this club face is on the way down. His path is out to end, and he's wiping across it. You can see it. You can show it to him on film. If you videotape, you can explain it to him. But he's still going to make that move till you get him out of it. When I get someone that slices the ball a lot, I make him hit hooks. I'll close him off, get him in these crazy positions, make him release the club around him, because what will happen is he'll meet in the middle. And vice versa, if you get somebody who's hitting a big hook, now there's two ways to hit a big hook. A good player drops the club too much from the inside, spine backs up, hands release. A bad player comes over the top of a closed club face, that's a pull hook. I'll do the opposite. I'll make him hit big slices. And you'll find that by going to a radical different path in the golf swing, you can do it with, say, a seven or eight iron and just tee the ball up, put them in the complete opposite position they're in at a dress. If a guy's coming over the top, if you close him off real bad, he can come over it and he's still going to be pretty good. And make him hit balls with like a seven iron teed up and make him do slow motion swings. Actually have the guy make a swing. I'm going to do this one really slow because I'm a little tender. And get him the feeling of his left arm folding, right arm going over. You can give him the split grip feel where this folds and goes. And make him hit balls in slow motion for about 10 minutes in a complete opposite position 
And the next thing you know, when you get him squared up, he gets on a better path. So I'm a great believer in opposites. If they're hitting it this way, I'm going to try and make them hit it that way. It's something that's worked for me my whole career when we're dealing with high handicaps. Don't ever give up faith in the guy. Boy, that's a hard one. You get, you get a person, an older guy, who's just learning how to play golf. And he, he's got the loft position, and he's got no coordination. I'm not going to explain loft. You already know what it means. And he's got no coordination. Man, it's tough. So you got to start just getting a club on the ball. And he's up there. You know, he's the kind of guy that he's swinging as hard as he can in case he hits it. And he, he's, he's one out of 50 he's going to make contact with. So I like a lot of slow motion golf swings. I like making people teeing balls up with a seven iron and making a slow motion swing because you can actually physically get them to make the, the move. When I changed Tiger Woods swing, when I changed Ricky Fowler's swing, they hit a lot of balls in slow motion at first just to feel the motion, just so their body could feel the positions they were in. Because, you know, a hundred shooter can't feel anything. He just feels a bad shot because that's all he's got. And as soon as you get that guy to make contact, and the interesting thing is you get a guy swinging in slow motion, you can't believe how solid they hit it and how far they hit it because they're going at it 100 miles an hour going back. And you clear their mind. You get all these thoughts out of there, fold this arm, get this path, go this way. Forget all that crap. Just set the guy up in a position and just make him swing in slow motion. You, you may have to get in there and physically move him a couple times to feel it. But if you'll do that, the student will then have a little idea of what he's trying to do, and he'll actually feel it. And that's the whole thing, is to get the people to understand why you're telling them what, what to do and to get them to feel it. So I use slow motion swings. I use it with good players because it really helps. Okay, let's get into practice thoughts. I love this one. You'll get to a person on the range and you say, what are you aiming at? Oh, I'm not, I'm not really aiming at anything. Well, you know the best thing, sir, about aiming at nothing, you'll hit it every time. But it would help if you'd have a target on every shot you hit because it's pretty easy to hit the range. If you're missing the range, maybe you and I don't have a chance, but if you're, if, you've got to be target-oriented. And I try and get people, I said, look, I had a guy the other day at our academy in, in Vegas, and he says, how far is that red flag out there, Mr. Harmon? I said, how far do you want it to be? Because if I tell you, you're not going to like it. Because they have this ego, this feeling of how far they hit the ball. Targets are important when you practice. And don't let a guy get locked into always aiming in the same direction. If, if you're working on him, he's, make him switch and aim over here, make him switch and aim over there, because then he's got to go through a pre-shot routine. He's got to get... He's got to get an alignment. You can use the Jack Nicholas of bringing the target in close, and he's got to go ball, target, ball, target, target, and back and forth. But if they're aiming at nothing, they're going to hit it every time. And that's a line I use all the time when people aren't aiming and stuff. Feel and real are very seldom the same thing. Think about it when you teach, and you tell somebody what they're doing. If, if That's where video became so good, because... Do I need video to tell the guy what he's doing? No, I can see what he's doing. But it, it reaffirms him when you show it to him what he's doing. Feeling real, with, even with good players, is very seldom the same thing. Meaning what they feel they're doing, they're not actually doing. Ernie Els came to see me about six, seven years ago. And he, was, he says, Butch, I'm just hitting it all over the place. I said, well, let me see you hit some. So he's hitting a seven iron. And Ernie Els, guys won major championships with a seven iron, was aimed 20 yards to the right. Club face was wide open at the top, 20 yards to the right, and just chasing it to get it back online. I said, where are you aiming? He says, oh, I'm aiming at that yellow flag out there. I said, oh, really, take a set up. So I made him get in his stance, and I just put the club here, and put the club here, and stood in his stance. I said, now go behind me and tell me where you're aiming. And he was literally aimed 20 yards to the right. He couldn't believe it. He says, I can't believe I'm aiming that far off. He said, how did I get into that? I said, I don't know. You tell me. You're the one aiming over there. You tell me how you got there. But it's funny how people get. Now, if I had just told him that, well, Ernie, you're aimed 15, 20 yards to the right, he would probably dispute that because the ball was actually going to the target. With this open club face, he was backing up and he was chasing it, and he's got such good timing that he got the back, ball back online, but they were miss hits. The ball was getting hit all over the club face. So feel and real aren't always the same thing. That's where video stuff comes in great. When you have video, you can just 
show it to them and it reaffirms what you've been, been telling them. You don't need to overuse it, but it's always good to have it. Okay, practice thoughts. I got a whole bunch of them written down here. I'll just go through some of the stuff I think is important. Progress comes through practice, perfect practice, not just hitting balls. If you're standing there firing away and you hit a, a bucket of balls in 20 minutes, you haven't done any practice, you get an exercise. So you have to explain to your students how to practice, what they need to practice. No average golfer likes to practice what they're not good at. They always want to go to the range and practice what they do well. They don't want to practice what they do poorly. That's our job, to make them do the stuff they don't do well. So perfect practice will make permanent, not practice. If you're practicing the wrong thing, you're going to continue to get worse. Our job is to explain to them how to do it. Some of the other stuff, and this is all stuff I learned from my dad, the learning process takes time. How many times have you given a guy a 30-minute lesson, and he goes out and doesn't play any good? He says, yeah, I took that lesson from that guy, but I'm, I threw that out. That didn't work at all. And you listen to the best players in the world when they do interviews, when they go through swing changes, said, yeah, it took about six months till I felt comfortable with his swing change. And this 18 handicap didn't feel good because he didn't play any better in 30-minute lesson. You've, you've got to explain that to them. We have to tell them that practice and change is going to take time. It's not going to happen overnight. I mean, in probably the, the swing of the good players that I've had the opportunity in my life to change, most of them, the naked eye, you don't see a lot of the changes we've made. If I slow it down and sh show you club face angles and different angles, you'll see the changes and stuff. The one that you see the biggest change in is Ricky Fowler because Ricky Fowler used to take the club back this way where the club was way outside of his hands here and then he had that rapid drop under way behind, lay it down and go and he timed everything up. I first started working with Ricky and when Phil won uh, the Open Championship at Muirfield, God, it's been three years now, and he had played a lot of golf with Phil, so I had seen Ricky play a lot. I've known Ricky for a long time. And I had seen his golf swing, and he missed the cut. And he called me and says, hey, after all your guys tee off, will you come watch me hit some balls? I'm hitting it terrible. I said, yeah, I know. I saw you in the game on Tuesday. It was awful. And I said, yeah, I'll watch you. So I go out there, and, you know, he's, he's hitting an eight iron. He's doing his normal way and it's laying down. I said, look, first thing we got to do is we got to change this path. I said, you're so bad off the ball. I said, this position in your swing, this shaft is so far outside of your hands. Now you're not going to continue that way. And then you go from here, you got to get out of it. And you drop this club way down here. You come way from the inside with this fast, violent move and you time stuff with your hands. I said, so we have to change the takeaway. You have to get the club. I took two clubs. And I put one where I wanted him and one where he, he was. I said, now, there's three feet different. In those, and, and that's a good way when you teach, when you're showing a guy different positions in the swing. Take two clubs. Put one in the position you want and the other one in the position he's in. So he had one club out here, and where I wanted him was here. There was three feet difference. Then you can show him how these are going to travel different to the top and how you're either going to get out of it or be right on plane. And so I said, here's how I want you to hit some balls. I want you to go right here. Stop, look at it, and then start your swing. You see him incorporate that now when he plays. He actually makes his last waggle is here. Then he comes back and makes his swing. Well, he hit balls for almost two months like that, practice swing. But that particular day on the range at Muirfield, he had a hard time doing it. And for like five minutes, he's topping them and blading them. And he says to me, he said, now, are you going to make a fool out of me standing up here in front of all these people? I said, no, you already did that with the first 36 holes you played, so don't worry about it. I said, we've got to change this. And that's how we started. And now he's got the club back on playing better, and he's, he's played so much better, and he's got himself up a top 10 in the world in playing. And it was a simple change. The change actually went from to here versus to here. This change changed everything. It changed where his hands are here, how the plane of the golf swing came down, the club base angle at the top changed, all in one simple movement. Now, we had to address some things here. And I still have to do maintenance because he still wants to get the left arm playing a little too low. And I like to see it get up here. <coughs> Excuse me. But this was the change. The change on the takeaway is what created all the ability to do other stuff. So when you're teaching, 
you'll find these little tricks that you can use to get people to get in the position you want. And the slow motion swings work great. I mean, you tee it up with a seven iron, they swing in slow motion. Half the time they end up hitting it further than they would with a full swing. Hitting balls and playing are two different things. Boy, there's no doubt about that. I mean, the, the driving range is for mechanical work. The golf course is for playing. And you have to explain that to your students. Because they can't, I mean, how many guys do we have? I'm going to tell you, probably the worst, not the worst, the hardest lessons you give are probably to engineers, because they, their mind works differently. They're, they're thinking about how, everything and how to build something. And a real important CEO of a huge company. The engineer has got 47 thoughts on a waggle. Let's see, what degree is this and this and that. He's got 15 thoughts on the backswing, and the swing's over within the second half. This very wealthy multimillionaire as the CEO of a big corporation, is not used to anyone telling him what to do. Now, here you are telling him what he's got to do. So you have to look, treat these things differently. Because golf isn't as hard as some people make it. It's a pretty simple game. All we're trying to do is take this stick with a head on the end of it and swing it around us and make it come back to the ball squarely and get the ball propelled in the direction we're trying to go. There's all kinds of things that can go wrong. If you think about it simply, if you're doing a clinic or something and you want to describe a golf swing simply, you said, look, you got two posts in the ground, these are your legs. When you go back, I want you to turn your body and fold your right arm. I want you to make a swing and turn your body in the other direction and fold your left arm. If you want to explain it so everybody understands it, fold, fold your back arm this way, fold your front arm this way, and you swing around it. And all of a sudden, the club gets in the way of the ball. My brother Craig, who I think was one of the greatest club bros of all time, he had this deal. He used to talk, tell these ladies, now just make an L. So you put an L there. Now put some zoom in it. And make an L here. Oh, Mrs. Johnson, that's fantastic. And he, so my brother Billy would imitate Craig. And he'd say, Craig's the damnedest teacher I've ever seen. He's got more patience than everybody. He's got this lady out there. She couldn't hit it 50 yards downhill on ice. And he's got her believing that she can really play. He says, he's in there and he's got the L's going. Now, there you go. Make that L. Oh, put some zoom in there. Oh, gosh, that was so good. So good. The damn ball went right there. So now you're going to get better. Let's do it again. Okay. A little more zoom. Oh, yeah, that's really good. That's making a golf swing simple. And that's what we have to do sometimes with high handicappers. And I have to tell you, I've used the L and the Zoom, and I give my brother credit every time for it. A bunch of these other practice thoughts I've just written down here. I already talked about practicing your weaknesses, not your strengths. Practice T is for mechanics. We talked about that in the course you play. My favorite, if you aim at nothing, you'll hit it every time. Feel and real, not the same thing. Practice doesn't make perfect. Perfect practice makes perfect. All right, let's go into some of the things that I think make you a better golf pro. First of all, you need to learn how, this is going to sound trivial, you, can need, you need to learn how to give clinics. You need to teach yourself how to give a clinic, whether it's to a corporation group, whether it's to your juniors, whether it's to your ladies' golf association, to your member guest. You need to have a scripted way of doing it, you need to be able to do a 15-minute, 30-minute, 45-minute, even an hour clinic. And you need to script it. You need to write it down, how you're going to do it. The other thing I will tell you is, is teach yourself how to do some trick shots. Learn how to do some funky stuff. I got, got years ago, oh, 30-something years ago, I taught myself how to do a trick shot show. And I used to do these, these shows at member guests and stuff and make 500 bucks, which I thought was great in those days. I had clubs with hoses in the shaft and 70 inch drivers and all this BS stuff that I did. But I just used to do it for fun and it got to be a lot of fun. So I got this little show together and I did it. And I, I, when I started doing it, I literally wrote down everything I was going to do and everything I was going to say. So it helps you to learn how to do trick shots and stuff like that. And the best thing about doing trick shots is all you got to do is hit the range. If you get it airborne and hit the range, they don't, they don't realize it's not going very far or whatever. And if you miss the shot, always have a joke. 
have a standby joke, you go right into a joke, the guy forgot you hit the shot, you go into the next one. If you're going to build yourself a club with a hose in it, get a hydraulic hose, because it has steel in the hose and it can't turn. If you get a regular turn, it has so much torque in it, you can't hit it. But instead of putting a driver head on a 44-inch driver, make it about 38, 39 inches, and a hydraulic hose, the club is literally going to come back to however you put it down there, because there's no torque in this hose. What you do is you let it bounce off your neck and you just swing as hard as you can. Some trifical force is going to straighten the damn thing out and you're going to hit it. And if you set it down there dead shot, okay, I'm going to hook this one for you and you'll hit a hook and you'll get to where you can hit it 190 yards or so with a hose in there. And that one goes over great. Everybody says that great. And then you say, do you, somebody want to try it? I made that mistake one time and a guy went like this and the club came around and hit him in the eye. And I said, no, I better not let the guy try that. But little things like that you can have fun with because giving clinics are important. And if you're giving a clinic at your club, have one of your assistants tape it and then go back and look at it because I have always been my own worst critic. And I would tape stuff like that and I'd go look at it. Oh my God, that was terrible. I can't believe I said that or I can't believe I did that. And you'll get better at it. And it's not that you're trying to make a living doing it, but every time you have a tournament, the clinic you give is informative, it's fun, people enjoy it. When you have a big outing, they'll ask you to come give a clinic. They might even pay you to do it. Nothing wrong with that. But if you teach yourself how to do it, and you film yourself, and you critique yourself, be honest with yourself. I know when I first started doing television for Sky Sports, I've done it for 21 years now. I do all the majors, all the world events. I've done nine Ryder Cups. I went back in 95, 96 when I first started and would look and listen to my broadcast. God, I was terrible. I remember the first thing I did, small piece I had with Sky Sports, was at the Ryder Cup at Oak Hill in 95. And I, I didn't have that much to do, but I, they had me on this hole early in the round. So I've got my headpiece on, and you're talking. And, and it's hard when you haven't done this before, because you'll have two or three people talking in your ear while, ear while you're talking. You'll have a director telling you something, a producer telling you something, and then a girl counting you down to go to a different person. And now it's like nothing. You could have five people talking to me, and I, I understand it all. But that particular day, they said, all right, Butch, in 10 seconds, you need to switch to so-and-so. I said, OK. And then I just kept talking. And my, my producer yells at me, don't talk back to me, you dumb SOB. That went out live on the air. And I went, oh, I didn't even realize I said that. So I've won, I've won these awards in Europe for being a golf analyst for years, and they love to show that tape. They don't show any of the good stuff. They love to show that one of when I answer the guy. Oh, OK, good, yeah, all right, what? But be your own critic. Critique yourself. I mean, it, it's how we learn. When you learn how to do a clinic good, and I mean literally, if you've seen someone who's good at it, write down what they do. And try and teach yourself how to do it. Inflict your own personality into it and the things you're good at and do it. I mean, it works out great for you. It's a pretty simple scenario. This next se section I have before we get into golf swing stuff, I call these Craig, Craig Harmon's Secrets to Being a Good Club Pro. My brother Craig is the second oldest in our family. I'm the oldest. Craig's second, Dickie, unfortunately, who we lost 10 years ago, was third, and then Billy's the fourth. And Craig has always been the level-headed one in the family. Billy and I were always the two, two rebels in the family. Dick and Craig were the two sane ones in the family. Could be why they had the two best jobs. And Craig is a freaking saint. I mean, this guy puts up with crap like I can't believe. I mean, he, he, he would have members that would wear him out, and they were always right. My brother Billy worked for Craig three different times at Oak Hill in the bag room. A guy came in one time and he had these head covers. In the old days, you know, they used to have this little wire thing that went around all four. And he said, hey, I found this on the course. And he threw them at Bill and it hit him right in his chest. Bill picked them up and threw them back at him and said, they're not mine. He got fired. <laughs> Another time a lady came in, told, told Bill that he had lost her six iron. He said, well, how, how could I lose your six iron? He said, well, you lost it. It was in my bag yesterday. He said, well, who did you play with last night? He said, I played with my husband. Well, it might be in his bag. No, we've looked. It's not in his bag. Well, let's, let's go look again. So they had a bag there. Of course, her six iron's in her husband's bag. So Bill pulls it out and says, well, here's your six iron. Instead of saying, I'll put it in your bag, he goes, is this the one I lost? Is this it? Now he's got her backed up into this rack. This is it, right? This is the six iron I lost. He got fired again. So there is a way to deal with people that's a little better than the way probably Billy and I have done it. But I'm going to give you some of the things that I think made Craig 
to me, one of the great club professionals that's ever been. He's, he, says, he always said one of his goals was to stimulate golf at his facility, that he always tried to make it better through clinics, through all, anything he could. He said, you have to be like a duck because you're going to get people complaining every day and it's got to be like water running off of a duck's back. You just got to always... My father and Craig, the member was always right. He could be 100% wrong, but he was always right. And that takes a different kind of personality to deal with that. And Craig, Craig and my dad were geniuses at that. I myself wasn't real good at it. When I got home from Vietnam in 1966, I went to work for my father at Thunderbird in Palm Springs in assistant pro. I mean, given a lesson, I didn't have a clue what I was talking about. I just knew what I did in my swing, so that's how I taught. We had this, this general, General Wilson. I'll never forget it. He was a three-star Air Force general. He was the biggest horse's ass I've ever met in my life. The guy irritated me so much that I wouldn't call him general. And every time he came in the shop, I'd say, good morning, Mr. Wilson, how are you? Boy, and this just irritated the shit out of him, and I knew it did. That's why I did it. My dad said, but you've got to call him general. I said, Dad, he's, he's retired. He said, you have to call him general. Okay. Mr. Wilson, how are you doing? One day he said to me, can I ask you a question, Butch? Yes, sir, Mr. Wilson. Boy, and I said it every chance I could. He says, why don't you call me general? That was my rank. I was a three-star general. I said, well, Mr. Wilson, you retired, didn't you? He goes, well, it's customary that you call the people by their rank. I said, okay, Mr. Wilson, I'll do a deal with you. You call me sergeant, I'll call you general. He says, how about Jim? <laughs> I said, why, you won't call me sergeant? You want me to call you general? My dad says, Butch, get your ass back in the back here. <laughs> but I think dealing with members is a unique thing, and, and sometimes it's not easy. Craigie and, and my dad, and I, and I wrote this one down, is you have to anticipate problems because you're going to have them every day. And you have to anticipate that you're going to have them, especially when you're having big tournaments. And you've got to learn how to deal with them. The other thing that my dad, my dad had this great ability to always remember somebody's name. I'm not very good at that. Craig was very good at it. But if you can always learn something about every one of your members, what they do, who their kids are, where they play golf, their wife, and every time they come in the shop, you know, you're, hey, Mr. Johnson, how you doing? Hey, I saw your son played really good in this junior tournament, or... Your wife is making such great improvements. Hey, great merger you had with this company the other day. It puts them at ease. It, it allows them to think that you actually really do care about them. Now, you probably don't give a shit, but it's a good thing to make it sound like you do because it's a good PR move. So if you can learn something about each one of your members and every time they come in have something positive to say about it, that was the other thing my dad used to say about me, you don't have a positive thing to say about yourself. How the hell are you going to say anything about the members? But this, is a, to me, is a, a trait that I've learned through the years is wonderful. Have fun with problem people. This would be the General Wilson story. My dad and Craig would, my, would always say, look, we, are always, we have certain members that are problem. You've got to kill them with kindness. You've got to be overly kind to them. You have to take an interest to them. I used to say, yeah, I'd like to kick the guy right in his... He said, no, no, you just be nice to him. Just be nice. You've got to bring him around. He says, that will be your challenge. Mr. Smith is a horse's ass. You're going to make him a good guy. He's going to like you. And you're going to do it with all different ways. And it's not something that's easy to do. It's something that makes you better at what you do and helps you succeed. I already told you about the ladies. The ladies are the key. Boy, there's no doubt about that. My brother Bill, when he worked at Oak Hill, any of you have ever been in the Oak Hill Pro Shop, there's a door that goes into the men's locker room, and, and it's only about six feet door. It's, you know, been there a hundred and something years, so people have to duck a little. So Billy was on the first week of working for Craig at Oak Hill, and one of these members, he's six foot seven, he comes in and he's, oh, you're, you're the new assistant, Bill, I'm Mr. So-and-so, nice to see you, and he turned around, and he didn't quite duck, and he hit his head on the door, which is right next to the, the counter there, and he turns around, and he goes, you know, I could sue you. For me hitting his head on this door, and my brother Bill goes, now let me get this straight. You've been a member here 21 years. You're six foot seven. I've been an assistant pro here for one week. You hit your head on the door you've walked through a thousand times, and it's my fault. And the guy goes, yeah, you should know that. Next time you come, sir, I'll tell you to duck, he said. <laughs> but so you've got to anticipate there's going to be problems. You've got to know how to deal with them. All right, let's get into some... Uh, Analyzing students and stuff. First thing, 
Okay, here's, here's where I'm going to ask you guys a lot of questions. You've already talked to this, this student about how much they play. Do they like to practice? Do they not like to practice? Do they have any ailments, bad hips, bad wrists, any surgeries? So you pretty much know about that. So then he starts hitting balls. What's the first thing you look at? Anybody? Just holler it out. Grip. Perfect. Anyone else? What are you aiming at? That's right. Good. Anyone else? What's the ball doing? Fine. First thing, grip. What you got to hold the club with. It's the one thing that I don't see a lot of people address anymore, is how people hold the club. Everyone has their own way of doing it. For me, it would be going back to what I said before, basic fundamentals. Grip, posture, ball position, alignment. First thing you look at. He's I'll probably hit, I, I will have a guy, if I've never seen him before, he's going to hit maybe a dozen balls before I say anything, because I'm, I'm watching everything he does. I, I've been fortunate, and I can't tell you why I have this, I see things other people don't see. I've, God gave me a gift with my eyes. So when I watch a guy see something, I see about 60 things at one time. I can see his grip, his posture, alignment, his stance, the path, the club face angle, arm angles, and all of these things, and then something just jumps out at me. The one thing jumps out at me. My wife says I'm the worst person in the world to go to a movie with because I see every flaw in the movie. Did you see that? His tie was in this place, and now it's back over here. She goes, will you shut up? I'm trying to watch the movie. So that blue Cadillac has gone by five times already. Did you notice that? Shut up, Butch. I'm trying to watch the movie. Then someone behind me goes, excuse me, sir, would you shut up? We're trying to watch the movie. Well, I see stuff that I don't know why I see it. I just see it. And the more you teach, the more you'll train your eye to see it. But as I said before, when they're first warming up, basic fundamentals should be the first thing you look at. Let's talk about what effect the grip has on the, on the golf club. Now, you read people say they want to see you at the top of the backswing with a flat left wrist. You've heard that a million times. Well, that... That's a bunch of BS because how you grip the club reflects in how you're going to get there. If you think of Fred Couples with a three-knuckle grip, if he had a flat wrist at the top, this club face would be so shut he couldn't hit a shot. He's got to get this way because the grip influenced the club face angle. If you have someone who has a really weak grip over here, well, most of the time they're going to be a little in this position here because the club face angle is going to be a little better. So don't look at the wrist so much at the top of the swing, look at the club face angle. Look at the angle of the club face at the top of the swing. This would be open, this would probably be a little square, this would be shut. Same thing here, open, not bad, shut. Open, not bad, shut. And a lot of times the grip influences that. If you've got a person who's got a real strong grip, and they get the thing like this, well it's dead shut at the top, but you can do one or two things. You can either get them in a weaker position with their left wrist, or you can make the grip more neutral. So don't get, once you get their hands on the club nicely, then watch how the club goes back, and you'll start to understand the correlation between the grip and the club face angle. So watch the club face angle. Now, let me ask you guys a question. How many of you think, at this position here, the club is toe up? Is that square? Yes, no? Just shout it out. You all think that's good? Okay, now here, here's my feeling on it. Here's how I explain it to people. If I was standing straight up, I would think that was square. But because I'm bent slightly, I like seeing that club face just a little that way, depending on the grip, if their path is good. Now, if you've got a guy that, that draws the club under this way, then you're going to have him feel like he fans it. But really, if you were straight up and down and we turned then we'd be square, but because we're bent a little, don't, don't get the feeling that this is closed. Just now, if it's like that, it's closed. And that's, you should always look at this first, the path of how the club, shaft, and hands work. Do they work together? Does the club head go first? Does the hands go first? Does the heel drag first? Does the toe go first? All of these things, you, you're watching this in the first 10 or 12 balls that this guy's hitting. You're seeing this happen. You're seeing this motion. Your eyes is already telling you that. Posture's so important. How far are they from the ball? You see men who tend to stand too far from the ball because it's a feeling of power. They get all stretched out. 
Then you see their poor wives standing there, and they're so close to home, and they're like this because they're too cheap to get their wife a lesson with the pro. And every time they, they top a ball, the husband says, oh, you looked up, honey, bend your legs. And the poor lady's standing there like this, trying to hit the thing. So posture affects the path of the backswing and what the arms and body do during this path. If you're too far from the ball and too bent over, you're going to stand up and then come back down. If you're too near from the ball and too straight, you're probably going to go down as you go back and have to work back up. You can also watch a, a shoulder plane of a good swing. Shoulders will work this way. You get somebody who's hanging, their shoulders work this way, their right hip gets high, they have to get out of that, and they reverse that coming down. You're seeing that in the first 10, 12 balls that this person's hitting. These are the things I'm giving you are the things that you're looking at. And you're watching that on every ball. And then you're watching where the ball goes, the direction of the spin on it, a high, low, left, right, right, left. You're seeing all these swings. Then the next thing you're noticing is this pat pace of this swing. Is it too fast? Is it too slow? Been a lot of good players with fast swings. Kid that just won the Masters, Danny Willett, has a pretty fast tempo. Someone told him to slow down, we never hear of him. Other guys are so slow, you could read the, the logo on the club as they swing. You look at Ernie Els and Fred Couples, they had this beautiful rhythm. So you will see with this person, you're watching this. You're looking at, okay, I've already looked at his, his basic fundamentals. I'm always looking at the path the club's going off the ball. I'm seeing the club face angle. I'm looking at the shaft. I see him at the top of the swing. Is the change of direction violent? Is it slow? Is there a lot of throw at it? Most people that swing too long have a bounce they throw. Most people that swing too short tend to throw their hands at it. Then you're watching the arms and the torso work together. Are they working together? Do they make much turn? Do they overturn? These are all the things that you should be looking at in this first 10 or 12 balls. You're seeing every one of these things as they're doing it. What's the head doing in the swing? Boy, this is an argument we instructors get in when we all get around and we've drank too much red wine, we start arguing with each other about the movement of the head. Some people think the head should stay still. Jimmy Ballard's a proponent of moving this way and the head moves. Jack Nicholas said Jack Grout used to grab his hair so his head wouldn't move. That probably ruined more players when you looked at and you read the book Golf My Way because I'm of the belief of your head and neck are attached to your shoulders. If your shoulders turn, your head's going to move a little. It has to move a little. Now what Jack wrote in his book Golf My Way, which was a great book, was that Jack Grout would grab his hair and he wouldn't move. But we forgot to tell you, he already turned his head this way, then he grabbed his hair and he'd already moved it back. That's a trick you can use guys that tend to hang on their left side too much. Tell them to do like Nicholas, turn your head back to the right before you start and they're already back there. It frees up all of this to move that way. Once again, in the first 10 or 12 shots, you're looking at this stuff. So now you've pretty much to analyze this guy's golf swing. Then you look for the cancer. What's the one thing? Once you feel like you've got it, you've looked at all the basic fundamentals, you say, okay, here's what I see, Mr. So-and-so. I see a swing that has a path that goes this way, cut face angles this way. You explain four or five things, and boy, he's looking like a deer in the headlights. How the hell am I going to fix all these things, and I can't break 100? Then you go to the one thing that's causing all this, and you fix it. And all this other stuff it may be a takeaway thing, maybe as simple as a takeaway. It may be no body rotation, uh, what I call RPB. Maybe you want to, he can't turn, just tell him to turn his right pocket behind him. Make, his, make him put his hand in his right pocket. Make a swing, pull it back over there. All of these things are geared to make all this other stuff fall into place. And if you learn how to do that, and you learn what it does when they make these different moves, you all, all of a sudden get better because you're not confusing the guy you're talking to. I think because we've looked at, quote unquote, the modern swing of the great golfers, because they're so flexible, they make very little hip turn, big 90 degree shoulder turn, there's no way we can teach our members to do that. It's absolutely impossible. Physi they're not physically capable of doing it. They don't have the ability to do it. So I think we've kind of lost what I would call trying to get lower body rotation. I think we've lost the feeling of letting people turn their hips 
because we've been enamored with watching a Jason Day whose swing is just awesome. I mean, he just sets it so perfect, and his body rotation is so good. Well, we got an 18 handicap at 65 years old. Good luck on that one. You're going to put the guy to the chiropractor within a week. So we've lost the, the ability to explain to them why turning is so important. And that may be the thing that jumps out at you. The guy slides, so his right hip gets higher. And if you're filming this from this angle, you can actually show it to him. Just draw a line on his belt, and he can see this hip's higher. So if your right hip gets higher this way, when you're coming down, you've got to get out of that, and then you go this way. So you're seeing all this stuff when you're watching this first 10 or 12 balls. This is your job. This is what you're doing. And then you, then you go in. Then you go back to what I said a few minutes ago. You try and be less is more. The less you can say, the more they're going to get out of it. Explain to them what they're doing. Explain to them how you're going to fix it. And then get into the process of fixing it. You can use the slow motion swings like I talked to you before. If you have video equipment, you can let them see it after every swing. I think it's a very good idea when you're changing a person's swing to film their practice swings. Because with no ball, damn, they look good. I don't know what happens when we put the ball there. They get locked on it. But with no ball there, a practice swing looks beautiful. You can film the guy's practice swing and the change that you've just made with him and tell him, okay, now come over here and let me show you this. And he'll say, oh, yeah, that really looks good. I said, now, there's no ball there. He goes, yeah, I don't care, but that swing looked good. Because the motion is just, the ball gets in the way of the motion. But filming practice swings when you get a guy can do what you're trying to get him to do is very important. It really helps the person understand. So you've, you've watched him hit 10 or 12 balls. You've looked at his basic fundamentals. You've already talked to him before the lesson to know if he's got any ailments, back problems, elbows, any, anything, stuff like that. You know that if he, he likes to practice, he doesn't like to practice, just plays on weekends, plays sometimes at night. Now you formulate a game plan. And you have to know this person to know how much information you're going to give him. Because if he's a guy that's not going to practice, you can't give him a lot. Because he, he's, he's not going to go out there and, and put into use what you're trying to get him to do. Then you have to get him a little lesson plan, tell him what to work on when he goes. If you get a guy that likes to beat balls, you can get in there. You can get in there and give him a little more because you know he's going to do the work and you know he's going to do it. If it's a guy who's just going to go play, you can't give him as much. Sometimes, you know, people say, well, you should never give a, a guy a Band-Aid. Well, sometimes you have to. Sometimes you have to give him something that just lets him get to the first tee. You know, nowadays with the modern drivers, it's great. I mean, a guy's slicing it, and you just crank it back. You make it upright and close it and give it back to him. It's going to help him out instantly. In the old days, we used to take a wood and bend it over our knees and hook it and they get wide open right in the hosel and stuff. But all of these things are geared to help this student get better. The whole idea is for him to have fun. And that's the other thing you've got to do. You, you've got to have a voice. You've got to be motivated. You've got to make your lessons fun. Because just talking about a golf swing is boring. It's boring just talking about mechanics of a golf swing. But if you can interact your own personality in there, and for those of you who don't have one, go find one, damn it. Learn, learn how to have a good time. Learn how to get the guy to relax. I'm, I'm, I'm one of those glass half full guys, not glass half empty. I, I can have fun. And if you can get a, a person, a, a male or female, relaxed with, with a little bit of humor and, and, and a little bit of your personality, they learn better because you've already relaxed them. They're nervous coming to you anyway. They're not any good. They're paying you to make them good. So make them have a good time. Create an atmosphere that's fun. All right, so we talked about all those things that are important. I want to go into some other stuff here. These are things that I wrote for those of you who ever bought my book, uh, The Pro, which of all the books I've written was the one that was a labor of love because it was about our family. It was about myself, my brothers, my dad. And there's sections in there that I call Claude's Pearls. And these are all a bunch of BS things that he said to us when we were kids that we hated that are so true. And just to... to just to give you some of them, well, story about me. I remember I was playing in the, I think it was the Westchester Juniors. I was about 16 or something, and I, I thought I was God's gift to golf. I'm winning all these tournaments, and I had a terrible temper. It's what really kept me from being a good player, and I'd broken my driver. I know the pros already called my dad and said, what a horse's ass your son was today. And Arnold Palmer was my hero. I loved Arnold Palmer. I did everything like him. I hitched my pants up. I wanted to be Arnold Palmer. So I came home. My dad's sitting in his chair. 
I said, Butch, how'd you play today? I said, not very good, Dad. I shot 79. He goes, you know, I don't, like, I don't know why you get so mad. You've never been any good. <laughs> he said, now, if you, he knows I love Arnold Palmer. He said, now, if you're Arnold Palmer, I can understand it. He's good. He can get mad. You, you're terrible. Boy, I don't know what you're talking about. But he had this way of saying these things to you that would irritate you and make you try harder. My rookie year on the tour in 1969, I'd, I'd missed about four or five cuts in a row. Missed a cut in Cleveland. Had to go to those days we were rabbits. We played ahead of the tour and qualified on Mondays. I was going to Canada to try and qualify in Montreal for the Canadian Open. So I called my dad up at Wingfield. I said, Dad, hey, butchie boy, what's happening? How are you playing? Oh, not very good, Dad. Oh, really? Oh. So look, I got a flight in to LaGuardia. I landed at 1230. I'll be out of Wingfoot about 2. You really got to watch me hit some balls tonight. And tomorrow morning, if you could give me another hour, I said, I got to take a flight to, to Montreal to go qualify the Canadian Open. He says, what do you mean? I thought you were leading the tournament. I said, Dad, I missed the cut. He goes, ha, huh, must have had the paper upside down. I didn't see that. <laughs> you know, once again, you just want to go, mm -hmm, and you just... <laughs> But he would use stuff like that to motivate you. So what I, what I put in the book, I'll just read some of them to you here, what we call Claude's Pearls, because these were all little things that my dad had a way of saying. So he was something, man. He was, one of the things I used to love, he goes, you know, golf doesn't care who you are. Doesn't give a damn what kind of car you drive or how much money you make, whether you got the latest $600 Scotty Cameron putter or the latest new irons that cost 4000 a set. Golf doesn't care. Ball doesn't care. Doesn't give a damn who you are. It's only going to move where you make it go. So you guys need to understand that. So the problem with you guys, he was telling my brothers this, you guys get mad every time you hit a bad shot. Well, hell, it's not the equipment's fault. It's your fault. Get your head out of your ass. It's your fault. Understand what's going on here. But I like that. Golf doesn't care who you are. He said anybody can beat anybody on a given day. There's no doubt about that. Oh, some of these are are priceless. i got to find some of these funny ones. <laughs> it's one of his great lines he used to tell us, get over yourself, will you? You're not any good, Christ. Just go play golf. Just, you know, you're not, why, why do you, he used to tell me, why do you get so mad? I said, well, Dad, I'm a perfectionist. I want to be perfect. He says, nobody's perfect. Golf isn't perfect. He said, look, you, you caddy for me every day here. Some days I play good, some days I play bad. I said, yeah, but you always shoot under par. I don't know how you do it. He goes, well, some, some people have it, some don't. I have it, you don't. It's that similar. <laughs> that was, so that's what we grew up with in the Harmon family. People, people say all the time, he said, man, you guys took a lot of crap when you were kids. I said, well, you, Dad must have done something right. We all turned out pretty damn good. So whatever he was doing was right. But anyway, when you read that book, you'll see the Claude's Pearls because they're, they're pretty funny. And these are all stuff that my brothers and I lived. We had to live it. We, we went through it. Okay, let's talk about observing the ball flight. Why is ball flight so important? Pretty simple. Ball flight tells you everything you need to know. Tells you the path of the club, tells you the angle of the club face at impact, and the direction the club leaves impact. Just by where the ball starts, the spin on the ball, the trajectory of the shape, the shape of the shot. All of these things tell you, you should be able to do, if you've got a good player at your club, club champion, young pro you work with, and you worked a lot with him, and you know his swing, you should be able to put your back to him. And he should be able to hit a ball right here, and you watch the ball flight, you should be able to turn around and tell him what he did wrong. I do that to my tour players a lot. Or I'll put something up in front of them where they can't see it in their eyes, and they'll hit a shot, and I'll say, okay, tell me what that ball did. So I think I hit that a little on the toe. I think it turned a little this way. And most of the time it's right because I've taught them the feedback from what the ball does to what causes in their mechanics or their swing. So this is a little trick you can test yourself on. Get a, say get one of your junior golfers who's really good, and you know his golf swing really good, and just stand there and don't look at him. And hit, hit a ball, let him hit one. You could be filming it. And then go back and say, okay, here's what you did wrong. And he goes, well, how the heck do you know that? You weren't even watching me. Because you're watching the ball flight. That tells you everything you need to know. Where the ball starts, the spin on the ball, the trajectory of the ball tells you pretty much what went on in the golf swing. So don't get so wrapped up in all the technology. Use it when it's right to use, but don't get so wrapped up in it you don't use your eyes. Because your eyes are the best barometer you can have on what's, what's happening. You should be able to see from that shape of that shot what caused that. You've already looked at a guy's grip. You've already looked at his club 
excuse me, club face position at the top. You know a little bit about the path of his swing. So don't get wrapped up in just going over. The computer says you're three, three uh, degrees from the inside and this and that. And the guy goes, what the hell does that mean? I just hit a big slice. Please tell me what the hell I did wrong. So use your eyes. Learn to use your eyes so much more than technology. I love technology. I have uh, a lot of young teachers. Uh, Foley and I have these great, uh, great things on the tour. He says... God, they all walk around with their track mans. They paid 25000 for this, and they're walking around with their track mans, and they're setting it up. Now, now here's, this is really an oxymoron right here. Dustin Johnson is using a track man. <laughs> Are you freaking kidding me? He couldn't spell ox if you gave him the O. So he now has his track man set up. Now, he's using it for the right reasons. He only uses it for his wedge game, because I've made him work so hard on his wedge game. Poor guy, if he could have putted at all on Sunday, he'd have won the Masters. He uses it for his wedge game to start seeing how far he hits it. So he comes out of Doral, brings his track man out there, and he goes, oh, man, is there a plug out here to plug this in? I didn't, uh, I didn't charge it. Yeah, they got them all over the place in the range, DJ. I mean, hell. Then he says to my son, Claude, Claude, how do you set this up? So he sets it up, and finally starts hitting it, and then he, he looks at the numbers and stuff. And so I tease him all the time. And so Foley came by, and he says to me, oh, Butchie, I'm going to get a picture of you using a track man. Nobody thinks you use one. I said, well, it's not mine, Foles. It's Dustin. He goes, Dustin Johnson has a track man? I said, yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> so he says, what's he saying? I said, I went over. I said, look, here's the number. Blah, blah. He says, I thought you didn't know anything about that. I said, I got you believing that, don't I? <laughs> I said, of course I use this stuff. I just don't tell you I use it. But you get to use your eyes. Your eyes really can help you as much as anything because it's telling you what you're seeing. And when you observe the ball flight, that gives you an idea of what's going on. Now, when you observe the ball flight, then you have to go back and look at the basic fundamentals. Is the ball out of position? Is the grip too weak? Is it too strong? That's what's creating this ball flight. And you'll go back, is, is he starting with his shoulders four or five degrees open, so he loses this much turn, he opens up this much sooner coming down. Is the ball too far forward? And that's why he's open, because the more you move the ball up in your stance, the more your shoulder's open, the more your right arm gets higher than the left, the more you can't get the club back right. The opposite of that is the more you move it back, the more you close, the more this folds, a lot of times the more you get on the inside. So the ball tells you what's going on. Now you look at the guy or the woman, and you start going through your basic fundamental checklist. Now you're looking at their grip, you're looking at their posture, you're looking at their ball position. Because all of these things affect ball flight. Dustin Johnson this week on uh, Tuesday, had his, he was hitting balls, and they, it was really windy down there. And he was hitting balls, and they were going up in the air too much, and he goes, I, I feel like I'm coming in too much this way. I said, no, you move your ball back a ball. You got your ball too far forward, your shoulders are a little open. Just one ball. He was starting with his hands with a short iron at 90 degrees. He got to a longer one. It was going to get this way. So all I had, had him do was move it back this far. All of a sudden, the path changed, and he started hitting it good. So sometimes it's a little simple fix like that. Usually with good players, it is a simple fix. With high handicaps, you, you, you just scratch your head sometime. Where the hell do I start? Then you go back to just trying to get the club on the ball. Then you go back to Craig's, okay, let's make the L. And put this, oh, zoom in, oh, another L over here. Very good, Mrs. Haverkamp. That's wonderful. So a lot of times we tend to make it too confusing. We confuse the student. It goes back to what I said, less is more. The more you can say, the better it's going to be. Okay, I think we're going to take a break here pretty soon. So let me ask, so far, any questions anybody has? Just holler them out, anybody? God, this is a great crowd. The hell are they serving you over here? Yes. So, talk a lot about simplicity. Uh huh. Uh huh. Yeah, the way he drug it back, yeah. Well, Dustin, number one, this is how he's played his whole life. Yes, but this didn't cause any problems for DJ because it's someone who gets, and this is interesting, it's a good question, by the way, difference in why I left Dustin Johnson like this, why I changed Ricky Fowler from this to this. If you watch guys that get the club shut at the top, and, and this was easy for me because my father played from this position. He played from a shut position. 
David Duvall played from there. Trevino played from there. A lot of great players have played from a shut position. If a person plays from a shut position, they better have a fast body, and you'll find their head rotation moves beautifully through the ball so they can square the, the club up that way. If I had tried to change Dustin's position, he couldn't hit a shot. He, I mean, it, we could have worked our tails off, and he wouldn't be able to hit it. Now, he struggles a little on his wedge game, because I've gotten him where it's not near as, as bowed, and the club face isn't quite as closed on the wedge shots. I've got him a little better here, because I made it shorter in here, so he could control the club face angle better. Ricky's case, he couldn't get any better until he got out of that, because it had this part of it was bad. In DJ's case, even though he gets this way, this part of it coming down is good. He gets the club on the back of the ball, and he uses his left wrist this way because he's strong and he can hold it. When he wants to draw it, he just lets it go. When he doesn't, he just holds it off. So there were two different problems in two different scenarios, and that's why I, I changed one, just tried the other to get better. What, what my theory has always been, especially with good players, I never like to take away what they do naturally. I just try and make it better. I don't want to create a whole new swing. I just want to keep their natural motion in there, and if we have to change a position here or there, I change it. But I like keeping their natural motion. Any other questions? Yes? If it's coming from Hebron, this will be good. Uh, good question. Uh, in changing through time, what have I left behind that I don't believe in anymore? I don't believe in a guy leaving his, his spine back and head back like we did in the old days with wooden clubs and softballs because you had to get soft, soft golf balls. That didn't quite sound right. <laughs> you had to get back here to get the ball in the air, to throw it in the air. With modern equipment, you get more on top of it. So I really like to see a spine angle that's more on top of a ball at impact versus the old way we all used to be back here with a head back. I hate seeing a good player that has speed with leaving their head back because as I try and show them, this club head's going well over 100 miles an hour, and if your head stays back this way, it's going to cause this club to flip. And if you can let your head rotate and watch the ball go out, the club stays in front of your body more. So, Mike, I would say it's more spine angle and not having this position wanting the head to be more on top of the ball and go through the ball, because I think it helps the speed of the body so much better. If you think about extension, you, you, people talk a lot about extension. You think about a guy that leaves his head back, and he gets to here. This is as far as he can go. Now, if he had let his head rotate, this club will go out here another 12, 14 inches, which means it's going to stay on line more. So that's probably the two things that I think I've changed my philosophy on in teaching through the years. Basic fundamentals never change. They're the same. But that's probably the two mechanical things, the head back and a spine tilt to reverse C, that I've tried to get more people out of that and get them on top. Good question. Yes? Boy, that's, that's one of the greatest questions. How can you get people to go from mechanics on the range and not mechanics on the golf course? So, you know, as we say, it's the longest walk in the world from the practice tee to the first tee. I think that's where you have to really go for the less is more and, and get really simplistic in your teaching. You have to dial in what the one thing is and get them working on that. What I try and make my guys do, uh, say medium to higher handicaps, when we work on the, on the range, I, tell, I give them a, a lesson plan on how to do it. These are the things I want you to work on. I said, but now before you go to the first tee, because you've got to leave mechanical thoughts here and feel thoughts over here when you play. A lot of it is visualization. Good players see the shots before they hit them. They see the trajectory, they see the shape, they get in there and make it. Bad players see all the trouble. They see the out of bounds, the water, the bunker, they're, they're locked on that. So I try and get people to, before they go to the first tee, for example, to hit the shot they're going to hit off the first tee about three times. Just hit it. Don't think of any mechanics. Just step up there and hit. But that's a fine line. And you have to do that really within how you've created the teaching. I've got to stretch my back a little, I'm sorry. Uh, you've got to teach them the mechanical work we're going to do today is this. And, we're going to, and that's why I say pick out the cancer in the swing and just work on that. Don't work on 10 or 12 things at once. And once you get that fixed, a lot of the other stuff falls into place. The slow motion swings help because they don't think mechanics when they make slow motion swings. 
But that's one of the great difficulties we have as instructors, especially with analytical people. That's why I say engineers are so damn hard to teach because they, they overanalyze everything. That's a good question. And when you come up with the answer, write it down and send it to me. <laughs> yes, sir. What do you think of timing and tempo with the golf swing? Well, everybody has a, a rhythm and tempo within their own speed. As I said, Danny Willett has a pretty fast tempo, but he has a rhythm within that tempo. And Ernie Ells and a Fred Couples have this buttery type swing. Other guys, uh, Lanny Watkins had a real fast one. So you, what you have to look at is the individual. What is his swing like? Does he have a fairly fast motion? Does he have a slow motion? Then you have to see if he has a rhythm within that speed. Don't, one thing you should never tell a person to do is to slow down. If you're trying to get a guy that's got too fast a backswing, tell him I want you to be more deliberate with your backswing. I want you to finish this turn because as soon as you tell somebody I want you to swing slower, they'll swing slower to about right here and then they kick it into that other gear. Two things you never say when you teach. I think you should do this. You think? Damn, I'm paying you. You better know what the hell I should do. Don't ever say I think. Just be positive. Okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to do this. And with the tempo thing, he said, that's pretty good. Now I want you to put three balls down with a driver. The first one, I want you to make a nice smooth swing. Just go right into the second one. I want you to make it just a little harder, and the third one a little harder, and then find which rhythm they swing the best with without a bunch of thoughts. But just because a guy has a fast swing, he may be a pretty good player. Maybe the best iron player I ever saw in my life was Nick Price. His club ball contact was phenomenal at all times, and he had a quick tempo, but he had a rhythm within that tempo. So you, ha you have to look when they're playing well, what is the rhythm in that tempo, and then you can explain that to them. Yes? So you talked a lot this morning about the mechanics of the mm -hmm. but a lot of what I've read about your influence, uh, particularly on good players, has nothing to do with mechanics. It's psychological or perhaps coaching. Can you comment on that a little bit? Well, we do a lot of mechanical work in our practice. Uh, I've always had the ability, once again, I don't know why, to get inside my guys' heads. Uh, every player I teach is different. Uh, if you look at them, the success I've had with 30 or 40 players, numerous and won major championships all over the world, they all have different swings. None of them swing the same. The only two that look remotely close were Tiger Woods and Adam Scott. When Adam Scott came to me when he was a freshman at UNLV, 18-year-old kid, that's kind of how he swung, so we just improved on it. With tour players or really good players, especially when they're preparing to play in a big event, you have to know their personality. One of the secrets, I think, that is that the things that have helped me with, like, gosh, I've been teaching tour players almost 40 years now, 38 years or something like that, is because I played the tour, I played in major championships, never was as good as these guys, but I kind of have an idea of what they're going through. And you've got to know your guy. You've got to know when to kick him in the butt. You've got to know when to give him space. You've got to know when to give him a hug. You've got to know when to make him laugh. And I've always had the ability to, so far, to choose the right one. <laughs> And I'll get on them, all of them, at some point in time, because they need it. The tour players especially, people, people say to me all the time, if you had to describe your job teaching tour players, what would it be? I said, oh, it's very simple. I babysit very young, rich, spoiled brats. That's what I do. Because everybody is a yes man around them. Nobody tells them no. Well, I'm the no man on our team. I'm the guy who can say, and for some reason, they listen to me. Now, I have taken two guys to number one in the world, Greg Norman and Tiger Woods, and they both fired me, so I may not be right all the time. <laughs> but I think it's important with good players to know what makes them tick. Know when they're, when they're off what's going on in their mind and have a trigger that you, can, that you can get to. And sometimes it's just as silly as the story I told you about Steve Smith and his girlfriend just coming up with some dumbass, Steve Scott, I mean, some dumbass remark that triggered him. But it's, it's a little bit of a a technique of just watching how my guys play and when they're off. I mean, the Masters, the funniest thing about the Masters, the only other major championship great players are more nervous at is the Ryder Cup. Ryder Cup's the most nervous I've ever seen great players. But the Masters is the most nervous of all the majors because it's been eight months since there was a major. The PGA was over with in August, and here we are in April. Brent Snedeker, one of my players, is probably playing as good as he's ever played right now. I mean, this poor guy, you couldn't have stuck a pin up his rear end this weekend. He was so tight. He wanted this tournament so bad. Even his trainer said, I can't even work the knots out of him. He wants it. And, and he, he got in his own way. 
And finally, the first two rounds, he actually did a miraculous job shooting one under par because he played so bad, but he fought and scraped. And I said to him on Saturday when we go to the range, I said, if I hear you say one more negative word on this driving range, I'm walking off. I'm sick and tired of you acting like my grandmother and hearing about all your ailments and all this, what you can't do. Let's start talking about what you can do. You're Brent Snedeker, for God's sake. You've already won one tournament this year. You lost another one in a playoff. You must be doing something right, and you're, I'm listening to you. I don't think you can break 90. So get your head out of your ass, and let's play golf. And he, he looked at me and said, yeah, okay, you're right. You know, and his caddy said to me, if I said that, I'd be gone. I said, well, I may be gone too. I don't know. But it, he, he, he needed to hear it, and I was the only one that was going to tell it to him. So sometimes that's just what you have to do. Any, anything else before we move on? Yes, sir. Uh, you coach Tiger Woods. God, I can't believe it took this long to get one Tiger Woods question. That's amazing. Wow. Almost an hour and a half into it, the first one. That's pretty good. Uh, I'm kidding you. concerned at the time that, uh, that he might physically break down? No, I really wasn't. You know, he had his first knee surgery when he was at Stanford because he had a cyst behind his left knee. And they went in and they cleaned it up. The next knee surgery was the scar tissue had grown over, and they did it. And then he had another one, and the guy didn't do it right, and then he had another one. Uh, because of his speed, you're thinking because he locked that left knee so much when he came through. But if you looked at his, his swing, at impact, he was here. And then as this turned, this went. And I explained to him when he was younger, through his exercise program, how he had to get his torso stronger. And it, Tiger was really funny because when I had him, he wasn't into the big weights. When he left and you saw he got really bulked up. But he's always had little skinny legs. Of course, so we tell him that when he used to wear shorts all the time. He used to really piss him off, too. That's why we told him. But I, I really wasn't that concerned about it because he kept himself in good shape. Now, through the years, has that been a wear and tear on his body? Golf is going to be a wear and tear on anybody's body. There's no doubt about that. But when you've had three surgeries on the same knee and you've had three surgeries on, the, on your back in the same position, it's, it's going to take wear and tear. Tiger, most of Tiger's injuries came in the weight room. Most of the time he hurt himself in the weight room because he likes to be he-man and, and lift weights. Uh, I look at uh, the only one I would say swinging as close to Tiger's now is Jason Day. His swing reminds me a lot of Tiger's. He's not as long at the top. He really has a tremendous speed and his body unwind. He keeps his arms in front of his body beautiful. But did I think I was, what I was teaching him was going to hurt him? No. Did it? Uh, I don't know. He played pretty good that way, so I don't know. If he hurt himself, he's, he did all right in that 10 years, eight majors and... I'm teen millions. I even made a little bit of money that time myself. That was pretty good. <laughs> Anyone else before we go on a little further? Yes. Mm-hmm. Question was, uh, I was talking about finding cancer in a golf swing. What do I find is the most common cancer? In the average player and then in, a, in the good players. Good players are different than the average players. Good players error underneath. Their downswings, the club gets behind them and their bodies get around too early. Bad players error over the top. So the, the most common fault we see with a high handicapper is, uh, is all of them are over the top. And there's a lot of things that cause that, but the cancer is the club comes this way and the shaft is at this angle versus this angle coming down. That's probably the most common thing I see with the, the average player. Tour players, because they have such great hand-eye coordination, can play from bad positions. And it's the reason they can go three weeks in a row, maybe win a tournament, have a couple top fives, and then miss a cut. Because their swing got worse and worse and worse, and all of a sudden they couldn't time it. But the most good players err under the plane. They come from here, and they, they square everything up with their hands. And, and you notice it instantly, because you'll see... Instead of this shaft coming this way, coming down, you'll see the shaft start to lay down and start to lay down. And you'll see them time it. And then you'll, from your angle there, you'll start seeing the club come out like this because it's too close because they've timed it. And you better change that right now because that's going to get away from them. One more question and I'll go back to what? Yes. He was asking about Jordan Spieth's 12th hole at Augusta, about the pitch shot. First of all, he had a lot of options there. He could have gone to the drop area. He didn't. He could have re-teed, hit it from the tee. He didn't. They, they tried to walk back to a yardage 
they felt comfortable with. The problem down there is they mow the fairways back into you. So he was going to be hitting to the grain off a slight bit of a downslope, and he just laid sod over it. But if you looked at Jordan Spieth all week, he didn't play very good. He really was, was a genius, really, in the, in the way that he had that lead. And he started off playing poorly on, uh, on Sunday. I mean, you saw the shot he hit on four. He's thinking it's going out of bounds, and he's hollering at it, and he hit a quick hook off of five and hit it straight right. Then he made four birdies in a row. And it was funny because Paul McGinley and I were doing a commentary for Sky, and when he stood on the... Because this had been going on for four days. I mean, he'd hit the ball all over the place. You saw it on Saturday when he finished bogey, double bogey. And I'll get back to the mechanics part of your, of your question in a minute. And McGinley and I are sitting there doing TV, and we both looked at each other, and we hit our kill switches, and we went, is this the hole that's going to get him? And I'll be damned if he didn't hit it, leave it to the right again, and then chunk the wedge shot. I, for me... I think mentally the two bogeys upset him a little because he knew he wasn't swinging good to start with. and He knew he had been fixing it all along with smoke and mirrors and a great short game and a putter. Now his golf swing is interesting. I did a, an analysis of his golf swing on uh, Sky. He has an incredibly weak grip in his left hand, meaning his left hand is it's almost borderline a little bit on the left cylinder of the shaft. So he gets the club in a good position here, but he has a very strange position. Instead of letting this left arm fold, as most good players would do to come here, he carries this left arm high and does a lot with his hands. And I think that entered into that a lot because he was out of sync in his swing anyway. And you, he had the stress and the pressure of the situation just having hit in the water. Now he's over there, he's dropped it, he's on a little bit of a downhill eye. And that shot he hit there almost didn't reach the water. I mean, it only went like a yard into the lake. He almost left it short of the water. He hit it so bad. So I think it was the pressure. I also think it was a week where he didn't have his good stuff. And he knew it mentally. He knew he didn't have it. And at that point in time, it just caught him out. At the end of the day, he made a hell of a seven because he made a good up and down from the, the back bunker. It could, it could have been more disastrous. Okay, let's, let's go back to some golf swing stuff. Let's talk about faults and fixes. This is something you need to know. You need to know when a guy's swing is too long, what, what does it cause, or if a guy's swing is too short. So if you've got a guy or a woman that has a very long swing breaking down at the top, what's, what's that position going to cause? Anybody? What kind of shots are they going to hit? Fat, yeah, right. Anyone else? Come on, guys, you're all teachers. Don't hit it to the left. Good, good. Anyone else? Anyone? You can top it. Yeah, all these things can happen. The, the fault from that is they're like this. And any time you get there, this has to straighten out. When this straightens out, here comes the throw. Now, if your weight stays back, that's the fat one. Or your weight stays back too much, you can actually top it. You can hit it on the upswing. If you're too long and, and you're this way and you go forward... Now, as the young lady up there said, you can hit it to the left because you're probably going to shut the club face coming down. So you have to understand when you see this position, there's five or six different things that can happen from this position. And then you'll look at the student and you'll see the one thing he does and you'll understand how you're going to fix it. Okay, so a person that has too short a swing, what are, what are the problems with a short swing? Anyone? Lack of distance, yeah. Anyone else? Short swing. Okay, first of all, when you have a shoe, are you guys sleeping out there? What's going on? <laughs> it's too comfortable, this arena. First of all, if you have a short swing, you probably haven't made enough wrist cock. That's the first thing. That's why you have no distance. So if you get a guy that has a short swing, now a lot of guys have short swings because their body won't let them turn because they're older like me. But what you can do to give him something to hit, if, if a guy's got a short swing and he's holding an umbrella at the top of his swing, he's not going to hit it out of his shadow at high noon. It's not going anywhere because he's got nothing to hit with. First thing you do is you explain to him the nail and the hammer. We drive a, a nail into the board with a hammer this way. We don't drive it this way. Well, your golf swing is so much this way, you've got nothing to hit this ball with down here. So the first thing you have to do is show him how to put some wrist cock in it. You can do it by just setting him in this position and letting him make a practice swing. So once you set him in this position, you film the practice swing, the club gets here, 
versus here. That's the first thing. They see it. They feel it. They don't really know how to get back to the ball yet. But that's why you film the practice swing and let them see it. So most short swings don't have a lot of wrist cock. So the first thing you do is try and teach them how to, I mean, you can, you can make a guy swing like that and just turn and go like that. That's a great drill, but how the hell are you going to hit a ball like that? But it's some way you can get them to feel it. Just tell them to turn and do that. I prefer to make them try. I always say stand the shaft up. Let me see you stand the shaft up as you go back. Get this shaft straight up and down because what you're doing right now is you're here. So you have two different faults from long swings, short swings. And they create different shots, and you have to understand what they are. Club going too much outside or too much inside. Usually a person that takes the club outside is going to reroute it because they're not going to continue to go like this and chop wood. So most of the time they get here, they've got some kind of reroute. And you'll see that instantly when you stand behind them because you'll see the club go this way and you'll see the shaft lay down. A lot of times with high handicaps, they think the more they get inside, the better they can hit it. The more they go in, the more they come over it. So you have to have drills for these two things. For the people that come over the top of it, which is probably 70, 75% of the people we, we teach, we call it Jim Furyk drill. I'll take an aiming pole and I'll put it on the ground. Here, I'll stand right here so you can see it. With this line right here, I'll put this aiming pole on the ground from right here, and I'll say, okay, I want you to take it back outside of this aiming pole, and I want you to come down and hit it from the inside of the aiming pole. And I'll have them do it. I'll tee it up with seven iron and have them do it. The pole will be about right here. I'll say, okay, do it in slow motion. Go here, come from here, and hit it. And you'll be amazed how solid they can hit it doing that because they've gone the other way. Their motion has always been right shoulder comes out. I mean, you can tell them, you know, I want you to keep your right shoulder back. I want you to keep your back to the target more as you come down, which lets your hands and arms drop. We found that using the Jim Furyk drill is good because they go here, and then they come from the inside. And you make them do it in slow motion, and you tell them it's going to be a loop. You have to go this way and this way. And so it's interesting how the path starts to change with the slow motion swing. First thing you do is you film the practice swing, like I showed you. You show them the practice swing, and they go, oh, my God. You see a shaft that was coming down this way, and all of a sudden a shaft that's coming down this way, it changes. But you have to have a drill for various positions that you see these people get into. Whether it's drills that you've learned from trial and error, whether it's stuff you've read about. Uh, I think McLean wrote a book uh, years ago, Drill Swings, which was pretty good. Had a lot of good stuff in it. He stole it all from me, but that's all right. I don't care. We're friends. Big problem we have in today is reverse pivots, hanging on your front side. You see it all the time. People are here, and then they go here. Or people are here, then they go over the top of it. I heard Gary Player give a clinic once. Oh, God, it was about 25 years ago. And he said something that, that always stuck out in my mind when I teach of people that don't understand a weight shift. He said, if you think about it when you make a swing... Your weight goes in the direction the club goes. When your club goes back, your weight goes to the inside part of your back leg. When the club comes down and goes forward, your weight goes into your front leg. And it was so simple that it made sense to me. And I've used that for a lot of people, especially people that reverse pivot. Now, when someone reverse pivots, it's very easy to explain it to them when you're filming it from the caddy view because the left knee goes straight out of the camera. So if a guy's reverse pivoting, you're seeing his leg like this. If you just show them that if this just comes back a little, or if you have them lift their left heel a little, all of a sudden the motion changes and goes in that way with a reverse pivot. Because you do, do one or two things. You go forward here, backwards here, or you stay here and you come right over the top. So you need a little drill that helps them get out of it. But I like Gary Player's line of your weight always goes in the direction that the club's going, because I think that's good. I think it helps them understand there's a big argument. Uh, Brandel Chambly just wrote a book. Can you believe I read all this crap? Yeah, I do. About you have to lift your left heel up. Teachers have lost the art of telling everybody to lift your left heel up. Well, I agree with that. If you have to lift your left heel up to make a turn, heck yeah, do it. If you can't make a turn, but if you pick it up, you've got to put it back down. That's one of the reasons if somebody's flexible enough to make a turn and not pick it up, I'm okay with that. 
Another thing you can do is flare feet. If you have someone who can't turn, take their back foot and flare it open, and it's going to allow their hips to turn more. If you get someone who is, is pretty pigeon-toed or left foot's too straight and they can't rotate it, have them open it. Have them get wide open. I mean, get, get your left foot wide open. Next thing you know, the hip gets out of the way because you've already put it out of the way. So there's a lot of little tricks that you can use that will trigger what the people are doing that is going to make you look like a genius because you've got to know how to do something. And it's just basic stuff. Oh, let's see. What else can we... Oops, sorry. Let's see what, how do you get... This, this is one I get all the time. This is one you get all the time. How do I get more speed? Well, sometimes if you ain't born with it, you ain't getting it. It's pretty simple. How do I get more speed? My club head speed... The track man says my club head speed is 78 miles per hour and I'm embarrassed. How do I get more speed? Well... You can do it with swinging a weighted club, if you want to do that, if you want to swing a weighted club. We were, as kids, we were made to swing this heavy club my dad had in the backyard 50 times every night after about 10, your arms wanted to fall off. <laughs> Hello. It generates more speed. It helps you generate more speed. There's all kinds of gears and stuff that you can buy that help you get speed, but really speed comes from being in the right position here and syncing up your arms and your body together as you come through. That's how you get more speed. You're not going to get more speed if your hands are flipping out and your body's not moving or your body's out running your hands and arms. You're not going to get a lot of speed that way. So you have to explain to them the positions they're in and get them to get more speed. And then if they can get the club coming from the right angle, make impact, they're going to get the best out of their ability. And that's what you have to explain to them. They all, it's so interesting with our students and your members how often they think they hit a ball 300 yards. I mean, how many times do you hear that? I said, well, how far do you hit your driver? Oh, about 300, 305. <laughs> really? Playing in the winter or what? It's ice or what the hell's going on here? Then you get a hole that's 320 at your club and they're hitting seven iron to it. So I thought you hit it 300. You should be chipping at the green. Oh, I do. I just miss hit that one. So everybody's enamored with distance. So we have to explain to them that you can only hit it so far. My job is to get you consistently getting the best out of your own ability. That's the big key. I can't tell you how many times I tell people, they say, what's the secret I need to do every day I go to the golf course? Leave your ego in the car. Because your ego's messing you up. Because first of all, you're not near as good as you think you are. Which is going to make you worse, because you're really not that good to start with, as I learned as a kid. And so if you can get them to leave their ego out and then just get them to get the best out of their ability and then work on their short game. My God, if you, if, if you could get every one of your students to spend an hour in a short game area with you and you explain to them, they're going to shoot three, four, five shots around lower without even improving their full swing because that's where it is. Jordan Spieth proved that this week at Augusta. He played awful for him. And he stood on the 10th tee with nine holes to play with a five-shot lead. Unfortunately, his, his mechanics caught him, and he didn't get the job done. But short game is the key. In this day and age, everybody talks about distance. My feeling on new equipment is that they got it wrong because the people we teach don't have enough club head speed to take advantage of the damn equipment. The tour pros should have their own rules, and we should be getting the stuff that goes further. I tell Titleist all the time, send me all the illegal drivers and balls. I don't play in any tournaments. I just like to have fun. I like to get one out there. Send me the stuff you send to Japan because they got different rules over there. They get the hot stuff. But, I mean, think about it. And the tour, professional golf, is the only professional sport in the world that's governed by amateurs. The RNA and the USJ are an amateur organization running professional golf. You say, well, it's, it's, it's different. No, not really. If you look at football... The NFL football is a different size than the college ball. NFL ball is a little fatter. College ball is a little thinner. Hash marks a little different. Some of the rules are different. Basketball, the key's different. The three-point line's different. Pros to amateurs. Baseball, they're using aluminum bats. The height of the mound isn't quite the same. So, yes, there are different rules. If the, the tours, the, the PGA Tour, European Tour, would in, enact their own rules, they could slow down the velocity a ball came off a club. They could change the, the length of golf clubs so you, you couldn't have a long putter. But yes, amateurs make our rules, so it's an interesting scenario. Now, I'm going to ask you a question, because we had this discussion on, uh, I don't know if CBS talked about it, because Bernard Langer sure still looks like he's anchoring to me. I mean, I know his left hand is away from his body, but his whole left forearm 
is still attached to his body, which to me, if you watch him go, is still anchoring. So I asked Colin Montgomery that because he plays on the Champions Tour now and Bernhard's beating the hell out of Colin. He goes, yeah, I've thought that all along. I said, so why don't you bring it up? Oh, no, he's Bernhard. You wouldn't dare bring it up. I said, so you like him kicking your ass with that long putter, huh? You're going to get me in trouble, Butch. <laughs> so I, but I think technology should be for the average player, not for the tour player. Tour player doesn't need technology. They're the best players in the world. We get into an argument all the time. You can't compare decades because they don't play together. But for me, I was having a discussion with some people a few months ago, and I, my theory is if you took Hogan, Nelson, Sneed, Trevino, Palmer, all these guys, and brought them forward in their prime, they'd be better with this equipment because the ball comes off of the club faster, it won't curve as much, they'd hit it further, they'd be better. If we took these kids back 40 years to persimmon heads and soft golf balls, I'm not sure they'd know how to play because they, their eye sees up here. Their eye sees everything up here, where in the old days we had to move the ball around bunkers and trees and stuff because you couldn't go up here with it. So it's an interesting argument, and I think that, that the governing bodies could make it much easier for the people we teach to take advantage of technology versus the pros getting, they take advantage of it because their club head speeds so, so fast and so hard. So it's an interesting discussion. Uh, we get, you know, you can't do it in other sports because, say for example, in the Hall of Fame, you look at the best middle linebackers. You go to Butkus and Sam Huff and Ray Nitschke and these guys, well, they couldn't even play in the NFL today because they can't pass cover because they were slow, but they were physical. Well, golf is a game you can actually think about bringing the great players forward and giving them new stuff, better agronomy on golf courses and stuff, and my God, they would have gotten a lot better, you would think anyway. So we, we talk about faults and fixes. We talked about coming over the top, coming too much from the inside. A lot of it goes back to basic fundamentals, setup, posture and alignment. That dictates a lot of the way the golf swing goes. I mean, posture and alignment is the thing that really gives you the feeling of where you're going in your golf swing. Okay, let's go back to any more questions. I like, getting, I like learning from you guys. Yes, sir. It's how you, the question, question is, I've talked a lot about fundamentals today. What, what do I consider fundamentals? How you set up to the ball, to me, is a fundamental how you put your hands on the golf club, your ball position, your posture, and your alignment. Those are things that should never change with what you do. And, and it should be said to anybody who plays good or bad, they should be able to do that because it takes no athletic ability to set up. It never thinks of that. The average person doesn't think about that, that, that we teach. They just grab the club and start swinging. Anyone else? Yes. Well, first of all, you have to have showed them what to do when they're hitting various shots. Once you show them that, you've got to give them the, the, the results of if they don't do it, what they're doing. The hardest thing for amateurs are when they're pitching the ball is teaching them how to use the bounce of the club because they're all using the leading edge and sticking the club in the ground or coming up trying to lift it. So you have to go through and explain to them what the different lofts of the clubs do. The more loft on the club, the slower the ball goes to the green, the less loft, the faster the ball goes to the green, the different trajectories of different ball positions. Phil Mickelson, of all the players I've taught, gosh, and I've had the opportunity to work with some of the best, uh, Seve and Oothabo, two of the ones that come to mind. Mickelson is very strange. He, he believes every pitch shot should be either played off the front foot or the back foot. If it's going high in the air, it's off the front foot. If it's going lower, it's off the back foot. He's the only one I've ever heard say that. A lot of the others say they play it in the middle of the stance. But looking at whatever the person does, you have to give them a plan when they go on what to do. The other thing you'll find is the majority of the people we teach in short game areas hit the same club all the time. They're enamored with their 60 degree or their gap wedge or their pitching wedge, and every little shot they hit around the green is with the same club. So you have to teach them what different clubs do and when to use these clubs, when there's more green, when there's not as much green. And then it just explain to them how to do it and let them go down there and work on it because they've got to put their own take on it. A lot of what I taught Tiger Woods when he was younger, I learned from, from Seve, Jose Maria, and Greg Norman. 
And then they'd, I'd tell Tiger, this, they did it this way, now you put your own take on it, on how you want to do it. So you can do that with your students. You can show them the technique to do it, and then they're going to put their own little feel on it. But it, it's so important to get them to, in the short game area. Nobody wants to do it. They just want to hit drivers these days, because that's all they hear about on TV is how far everybody hits it. Anyone else? Yes? Uh-huh. <laughs> My take is I want to kick him in the rear end and make him putt better. Uh, Dustin Johnson played better tee to green than anybody last week. Drove the ball better. Uh, uh, proximity to the hole was better. Uh, Dustin has a very long, slow putting stroke. And he putts good most of the time, not so much in the majors. Because I... For me, he gets his hands a little back, and we talked about this on the phone yesterday, actually, and he decels a little because he's longer, and I'm trying to get him to get his, his hands at least at a 90-degree angle, and I want the stroke to be shorter and faster through the, the ball because he tends to slow down. But that's how he's always putted. And he was funny when I was talking to him yesterday evening. He goes, yeah, I know. I just can't do that when it counts. Uh, so we've got to work on that because if you putt at all, this week you win. And it's probably now, his, his wedge play used to be terrible, but he's, he's gotten so much better with the wedge play. And, and it's funny, the story I told you, he literally brings a track man out every time he starts his session. And all he's looking at is his distance, how far he hits it, because I've told him his swing was so long and we've shortened it to use more body. And he's really gotten good by doing that, but he's got to work on his putting. I'm trying to get him out to Scotty Cameron to see Paul uh, next time he's on the West Coast, just to get him on film so he can see it. If he can, because if he putts better, this kid could win everything. He probably has more talent than anybody. I mean, he's not the brightest bulb in the chandelier, but that works to his advantage sometimes. I mean, it's stuff like this doesn't bother him. It would ruin anybody else. I mean, he's, you know, at, at Chambers Bay last year, when he three putted the 18th green, I mean, he hit a drive that went about 370 yards and a 265 yard five iron uh, to a ball that only stayed on that hill. I mean, I was doing the commentary and I didn't see one ball stay there all, all day and he got unfortunate to stay there and he three putted so I, I, I waited a while before I called him and about three hours later I figured he'd had a few beers by then we could talk about it. I said, so what was going through your mind there on that putt on 18? He, he calls everybody, bro, bro, I got a 12 footer to win the US Open. I'm sending it down there. I'm not shaking it off the end of my putter, bro. <laughs> well, I can't argue with you. It's, kind of wish he'd shook it off a little, but, but that's how he feels. I mean, he's just an aggressive player. How about the shot he hit on 15? I mean, everybody that's over there behind those trees is laying up. We're doing a commentary on TV, and, and uh, you and Murray, our, our lead commentary, I was with him, and he goes, well, surely he's going to lay up. I said, Dustin can't spell lay up. I said, I wouldn't be surprised if he's going to. I said, look at the practice swings he's making. This isn't a layup practice swing he's going. He said, well, this is crazy. The difference is he was trying to win the tournament. He was trying to do everything he could do to win the tournament, and he's an aggressive player. But the putter killed him this week, so that was a good point. You know, you saw uh, there was one other kid up there that, that had a shot there, and he laid up and didn't make birdie. But, you know, that's just everybody's different. Dustin is an all-systems-go guy. He's like a modern-day Arnold Palmer. He's going for it. We always say, and I don't want you to take this the wrong way that it sounds gross, but you've got to have big balls to be good in golf. And Dustin Johnson takes his of the first tee in a wheelbarrow. He just, he just wheels them up there because he's ready to go. He's, he's going he's gonna to give you all systems that are going to be go. That's what he's doing. You're covering your ears, huh? I knew I was in trouble when the first seminar I've ever given where they're praying before the seminar. I went, damn, I better watch what I say out here. Okay, we've talked a lot about golf swing stuff, things like that. Really, the most important position in, in the golf swing is impact. I mean, that's, that's everything. It's how the club arrives at the ball at impact, club face angle, arm, head. There's a lot of ways to get there. If you go to the Hall of Fame in Jacksonville, down there at St. Augustine's, you'll see a lot of goofy golf swings in there. But impact's the most important thing. We have seen, because of teaching, players' golf swings have gotten better and better. The problem is a lot of young kids don't know how to play golf. They know how to play far. They know how to hit it far. We had a great discussion. Uh, Jose Maria Othavo is one of my dear friends in life. We were talking last year about equipment and what the tour could do to make it different. You know, the talk of the long putters. Well, just make a putter be only a certain length and 
That's all you can use. But he, had to, he said, you don't have to change equipment. You don't have to change the ball. You don't have to change the driver. All you got to do is go from 14 clubs to 9 clubs, and we'll figure out who the hell knows how to play golf. If you only got 9 to choose from, you better be able to work the ball around. So I'll give you some tips with your junior golfers. Kids today hit the ball so far. Equipment has helped them. They got good golf swings. You guys are good teachers. But that's all they think about. They don't think about the scorecard has no place for how far you hit it, just a box for a number. We teach, my staff teaches some of the best young kids in the world. And we'll make them go out every other day with half a set of clubs. One day I make them play with an even number, and one day they have to play with an odd number. Because I want them to learn how to hit golf shots. Technology has kind of taken the feeling of moving the ball around away from younger people these days. So we try and get them in the habit of doing things they're not accustomed to doing. Bubba Watson probably has, and Mike, you and I have probably watched more golf swings than anybody, the greatest hands of anybody I've ever seen. Because his, his body is in the worst positions you could ever get in, and he does everything with his hands. I did it again on Tuesday when I was out walking across. I went down there to the right of the 10th hole and went over there where he hit that shot, and I still can't believe he hit that shot. Now, a right-hander couldn't have hit it, because if a right-hander was to cut the ball that much to make it go up, it would keep going up this way. But by hooking it, the ball would curve and come down, and that's why a left-hander was able to hit it. But he is the one golfer today that curves the ball more than anybody. He moves the ball around a lot. Tiger always moved the ball around a lot. Mickelson moves the ball around a lot for situations. So with your young players, I think it helps you to teach them how to move the ball around, how to get the ball to move, how to hit shots and stuff. You need to get them on the range when they're practicing and, and give the guy a seven iron and tell him to hit it 130 yards or change his trajectory, bring his trajectory down. With short irons especially, if you watch the best wedge players in the world, they never throw the ball up here. Their ball goes in lower because the lower trajectory allows you to carry the ball the distance you want to carry it. In my place in Vegas, I have nine plaques out there. There are six by six metal plaques on the ground that are painted white. And we have nine of them that go all the way from, say, depending on where you are on the tee, from 38 yards up to 168 yards. And my tour players will spend hours there with their wedge game working on it. And we'll move them around every day, and we'll draw a chart for how far each one is. And we used to do it with towels, but they'd argue, oh, yeah, I hit the towel. Well, this, you can't miss it. You hear it, it goes boing, and the thing bounces up in the air. And they have to go through the nine stations as fast as they can go. And all of them's wedge game has gotten better because of that. So anytime you can do distance control stuff with your, with your juniors, that helps them too. Golf's in a great place with young players these days because there's so many good ones, if you think about it. There's, uh, there's a bunch of them in Europe that you guys don't know about that are really good. You just heard about Danny Willett uh, this week. You probably didn't even know who he was. But golf's in a great place. We are witnessing the changing of the guard right now. As a kid growing up, I watched Hogan, Nelson, and Sneed. Then I saw Palmer come along, and I saw Nicholas come along, and I saw Trevino come, and then Watson came. That was a little bit of change. Then here comes Norman, and here comes these guys. Here comes uh, Faldo and Mickelson, and then came Tiger Woods. And now you're seeing all those guys go back, and now you see these young guys coming again. The difference now, I think, is the amount of them we have. There's so many good ones. I mean, just tons of them. You guys all have them at your clubs. The, the hardest thing you guys deal with in having members are the parents. The parents are a pain in the ass with good young players because they, they, they're pushing the kids sometimes and they're telling the kid how good he is. I had a father last year brought his 15-year-old son to me. The kid had a beautiful swing. And he wrote me a letter, and the only reason I saw him, I normally would... Uh, sent him to one of my guys, but I liked the letter he wrote, and he seemed like a very nice man until I met him. And then he, he came out, and his son started hitting balls, and every time I would ask the young man a question, the father would answer the question. And I'd say, no, sir, I, I really like to hear this from him. He said, no, I, I can tell you what he is. I said, I don't really care. I just want to hear your son. And so I'd say, okay, James, when you do this, and he'd say, oh, he does this, or he does that. And he kept telling me, he says, you know, my son's really good. He's really good. If he said it once, he must have said it 20 times in the first 15 minutes. And the poor kid's embarrassed. You know, he's hitting balls. He does have a beautiful golf swing. I said, so what does your son shoot at your home course? Oh, he shoots right around par every time. I said, well, that's not very good. And he says, well, what do you mean by that? I said, well, if he's not shooting three, four, five under every time he plays, he knows every break of every putt. 
You know, he never has the wrong club. I mean, if, you, if he's really as good as you say, he's, oh, yeah, he's really good. He's really good. So finally, I, I felt bad for the kids, so I told the guy, come over here, and I put my arm around him. I walked him over where he, his son couldn't hear this. I said, now, you need to do me a favor. You need to go down to the clubhouse, have lunch, just sign my name, I'll buy you lunch. Oh, no, I need to stay here and see everything. No, actually, you're screwing it up. Okay? I said, because here's the deal, mister. You've got to realize, I've seen really good. This isn't it. Okay? Doesn't mean it won't be, but you're not helping him. You're, you're over here blowing smoke up his rear end every two minutes. He hasn't answered one question. Every question I've asked, you're answering, I said, you're in a way. You need to go. If that, just go in my office. If you need to make some business calls, no, I need to stay here. I said, okay, now I'm going to put it to you in language you can talk. Get the hell out of here. Or this lesson's over with. And he looked at me like, what? I said, just go inside. Give me 20 minutes with your son. Now, here's the sad part. He went inside. His, his son said, Oh, thank you, Mr. Harmon. It's so much nicer. My dad, I love my dad, but he just wears me out. I said, I know. Now let's go to work. And the kid did have a lot of ability. And you guys, it's easier for me because I've done this for so long and I've, I've got a little bit of a reputation and I'm a little bit of an in-your-face kind of guy anyway. I'm actually a sweetheart, but they, a lot of people don't know that. <laughs> my wife knows that because, yes, ma'am, whatever you say. But sometimes you've got to tell these people. Now, if it's a member of yours, you can't tell them that because he's your member. But you've got to watch the parents with these kids because they push them. Everybody in our family thought because all four of us became very successful in our business that our dad pushed us, and he didn't. I grew up as a good athlete in Westchester County. I loved playing other sports. My other brothers played other sports. We played golf because we liked to. But nowadays, I think it almost ruins this. It's twofold. We're getting a much better athlete. Because the kid that used to play football, basketball, baseball, starts playing golf at a young age, doesn't play the other sports. Unfortunately, the hand-eye coordination isn't as good from playing the other sports. So we've got to watch a fine line there. But parents are hard. And I feel for you guys that all are at country clubs because you have to put up with them. You don't have a choice. So you've got to find a nice way around it where you can get the kid by themselves. And that's why I like challenging them. That's like I, I like telling them to go out and play with half a set of clubs. Uh, if they're all pretty low handicaps, I'll put a nine-hole score on them. Okay, here's the deal. If you shoot this, this is fine. If not, you're going to come in and you're going to hit 100 wedge shots for me. You're going to do this or that. So challenge them. Try and use challenge to make the kids better. Let's go to more questions. Anybody got anything else? Anything on your mind? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, change of football. Change of football. Uh-huh. Okay, the question was change of footwork, being grounded, seeing people up on their toes. What is the reason? You, you use Justin Thomas as an example. It's the one thing that keeps Justin Thomas from being really good. He doesn't know how to hit three-quarter shots. Justin Thomas, who's a very good player, hits the ball a long way for a little skinny kid, but he only has an all-out swing if you watch him. Eight irons and seven irons are nuked. Uh, he has Jimmy Johnson on his bag now, who's a great caddy, who was a good player in his own right, who's trying to help him with that. But the question is, when you see people up on their toes and, and feel them grounded, on a good golf swing, if you think about it, if you come down into it, your weight goes into this part of your foot. As long as your back foot, your right heel, moves ahead of the toe, you're probably making a good motion. If this foot goes this way and this heel comes out and around, then well, you're in trouble because that's following your hips. Uh, there's drills you can do. I, I like putting a baseball or a tennis ball on their heel and tell them to drag it a little and make it go just to let their footwork calm down a little because it, it goes back to Bubba Watson. He's all over the place, but he's a, he's a rarity. You see women are more up on their toes than men, something I never understood. For years, I always tried to get women grounded, and I was giving a lesson to this uh, doctor one time, and she was explaining the difference in the anatomy in a woman. They said, well, what you don't understand, a man's hips are his hips, a woman's hips are made to expand to give birth. So when they swing, their hip motion is different, and that's why they come up this way. And I'm like, damn, I never heard that before. I'm not sure I can put that in a book anywhere, but that's pretty good. <laughs> and so I started thinking about it, and the more I saw women coming up, the more I realized, well, if I can get them to turn these hips in a tighter motion this way, the feet will stay down a little, and everything will get more grounded. The, the biggest fault we see, and you see this even with 
with good players is they start here and as they swing they come up and you see their belt buckle or belly button coming into it like if you draw a line on their rear end here at impact you see they've come in this way and so that's when you have to work on staying in this tilt and the flex and then keeping the feet more grounded but I like seeing people that have a lot quieter footwork that goes with the motion of their swing of their torso working more and their body together versus the one that are jumping up here this way because hands are taking over a lot then. Any other questions? Yeah. Yeah. Well, in his later years, uh, he got so enamored with distance that, you know, as he got older and his body gave out of him, I never understood why he was so wrapped up in distance. I think a lot of that is what caused his back problems. Uh, when he was younger, he was longer. You know, in 2000, when he had that great uh, year when he won three majors, nine tournaments, he always drove with a, a 43 and three-quarter inch driver that was a steel shaft, and he hit 72% of his fairways, and he was the second longest hitter in the game. John Daly was the longest. Well, you let him be that long in the fairway with that short game, you couldn't beat him. But as he got older, for some reason, he still had this obsession with power, and I think it kind of hurt him. And it'll be interesting if he comes back to see what's going to happen. Okay, yes, guys. Telling me to stop, sorry. All right, terrific start to the day. We will have a chance for more uh, Q&A as we go on here. Uh, we're going to transition to the fireside chat with Michael Breed. Uh, I know many of you did email in questions, too. Michael's going to try and work as many of those in as he can. Uh, before we do that, we're going to take about a 10-minute break, take a look at your watch, try and be back in your seat in about 10 minutes, and we'll go from there.